All right, we're live. Um, thanks, everyone, who's here for coming. Um, this is our second hangout for the book we're reading, uh, Bible Unearthed, Israel Finkelstein, Neil Asher Silberman. And uh, just to reiterate for anyone that doesn't know about this book, um, it's basically summarizing the archaeological evidence for ancient Israel and some of the stories told in the Bible. Um, we read chapters 3 through, what was it, 5, I four think? 4 and 5. Yeah, we read 3, 4, and 5. Um, 3 was about um, the archaeological evidence for the conquest of Canaan, which was mainly, uh, that's Book of Joshua, and then um, 4 was who were the Israelites, which talked about, like, basically that. Who were they? What, um, where did they come from? Um, and then the final chapter talked about um, David and Solomon and the archaeological evidence for what's described in the Bible in regards to them, you know, the uh, empire, kingdom, whatever you want to call it, etc. So um, you guys want to just go in order of the chapters? Mm, yeah. That sounds fast. So uh, third chapter... Conquest of Canaan. Any uh, thoughts on that? Well, I'll just give you mine. I, I, uh, you know, I didn't know that much about, um, well, pretty much nothing about the archaeological evidence. So it's been really helpful for me reading all this stuff. I liked how we, how they talked about the. Um, when you look at the different layers in a lot of these ancient cities, the tells, the I think that's a word for mound, I think they said, you can identify the, the different layers, and they said at that time where, this, where these events, the conquest of Canaan by Joshua supposedly took place, you can tell that, um, that sometimes the cities weren't even occupied, really, at that particular point in time. Um, or had occupation by Canaanites after that point in time. So, you know, if they had been conquered, what are they still doing living there 100 or 200 years after they would supposedly been wiped out? So I found that especially really interesting. And, uh, you know, I'd heard, I had heard through talking to you guys and other people that, it, that there were problems like that, but I'd never read specifically about it. So I really liked the chapter for that reason. Of course, they went with a late date, the 1200s. Uh, but the fact is, I guess, no date. I mean, the biblical date is like 1440, and that date won't work for those sites as well. I don't think there's any date that can work for uh, the destruction of all those cities that Joshua describes. Yeah. So... I don't remember them talking about late date, early date. Is, did they just assume it? Is there like an, the other proposed date? Is what did you say, 1400s BC? The Bible chronology gives a date of around, it tells how long the Exodus took place before the temple was constructed. And so according to that, the date usually given in the Bible is about 1440, 1447, or something like that. But the uh, people... Usually liberal-minded scholars, <laughs> excuse me for still using that term, uh, but <laughs> it's all right. they're going with uh, Exodus describes the, the idea that the Israelites build Ramses, the city, and so they figure that it has to then come, has to be around the time of Ramses the second, if that's the case, and so that's why they changed the date to the 1200s. And that's the date that Finkelstein and Silberman usually use. Though that's that's not following the biblical chronology. So like I say, there's a 200-year difference. So there's an early date and a late date. But I'm saying either one, if you if you look at, if you try to look up each of these cities and find out when there's destruction levels, I don't think you can make it fit any scenario. Yeah. The other thing that was interesting was the extent of 
Egyptian control over Canaan in general at that point in time. So if you have a bunch of Jewish people leaving Egypt, wandering around the Sinai, and then coming in and conquering Canaan, which at that time was under Egyptian control, seems not very likely. So, Reuben's saying uh, that the early dating, 1400s, is the Christian dating, not the Jewish one. What do you... Oh, he says Jewish chronology places the first temple at 832 BCE. I think it would be unlikely that Finkelstein and so Berman would be dealing with specifically Christian dates. They're talking about the most probable scientific dates for that stuff. They're working either back from a date or forward from a date. So what would be their reference point that they'd be using the, the construction of the temple? You know, they listed it in the book and I can't remember what they were. Yeah, I don't remember it either. Yeah, but I wouldn't label what they're saying specifically Christian. Now it's based on biblical scholarship, yeah, but it's not necessarily Christian scholarship. Although I agree with Reuven yet that uh, the Jewish, specifically Jewish scholars from a religious background have placed it later. Shauna says, yeah, yeah. there's no way a huge exodus as described in the Bible took place at an earlier time than Ramses II. The evidence from the um, Amarna letters tell us exactly what was happening in Canaan prior to the reign of Ramses II. Yeah, that was one of the earlier dates, I think, one of the anchors that they were saying for probable dates. But, you know, saying that if you use those dates, there's nothing corresponding archaeologically. Right. Reuben, I think they put them in the 1200s, I believe. Yeah. Is that right? That's what I thought. Yeah. So, yeah, it would have been in the reign of, during the reign of Ramses II. And again, Canaan, I guess, was... Uh, Egypt had a, a major presence in Canaan at the time there, so. Um, it was interesting what he said, too, what they said, too, because I guess um, that city or town, whatever you want to call it, Hot, Hatsor, is that right? Hot, Hatsor. They said there was evidence of a destruction at that time, at that city, and a couple other places, too. And then they went on to say that that was probably actually due to the, um, I forget, was it the Sea Peoples? Is that right? Yeah, I'm thinking of the Philistines. Yeah, the Sea Peoples. I think eventually they, they basically said that there was multiple causes. It's hard to, to latch any particular one type of thing to account for all the destructions at those earlier dates. Right, yeah, yeah. It's way too early for any kind of matching with biblical chronology unless you want to revamp chronology completely like some have done. But then you come up with against the problem of carbon dating. <laughs> if you're going to rejig the dates, I mean. Well, according to some apologists, you know. <laughs> there's all kinds of problems with carbon dating. Yeah. But the Philistines were one of the sea peoples, by the way. Yeah, but there was some Egyptian text, right, that said it was yeah. an alliance between Philistines and a bunch of other people. But I guess, too, they were saying there were possibly, uh, the, I'm probably saying this wrong, the Myce, Mycenaeans, is that right? Exactly. As possibly in that, um, it, militarily active in that region, also possibly at that time. So yeah, like John said, a mi probably a mix of things that could explain. Because they, they talked about too that there was like a a general 
kind of decline of, of Egypt and the Hittite kingdom and a lot of the major uh, powers that at the end of the Late Bronze Age. Um, it's kind of interesting that the Philistines were most likely a tribe of sea people that were transplanted to Canaan by the Pharaoh of Egypt, not by Ramses II, but by a later Pharaoh, I, I think probably Ramses III. And it's been proposed that perhaps the tribe of Dan was a sea peoples called the Denoi or the Denyan, who might also have been transplanted to Canaan in a similar fashion. And if you notice their early land, the early land that was that was given to the tribe of Dan was a coastal region, much like the coastal region that was given to the Philistines. And doesn't it seem odd that the legends of Moses and Egypt are from the north rather than from the south, where you would expect that the people who came up through the desert would have you know, there would have been larger settlements of those in the south and that it would have been a southern legend. But yet it's a northern legend, which is also corresponding to where the tribe of Dan was settled. So I'm proposing that perhaps the early kernel of truth that comes from the Moses story is that some sea people, some tribes of sea peoples were transplanted to Israel in perhaps the 11th century, early 12th, late 12th century, and that you know they became part of the Confederation of Israel at some point. Their legends were incorporated. Hmm. That is interesting. When I was reading it, the first thought is, why not just say that the Israelites were the Sea Peoples? Because then you could incorporate everything that they actually did into the legends of Israel. I mean, yeah. Why not? <laughs> well, the archaeological evidence as presented in this book and in um, the later book, The Forgotten Kingdom, shows that there was, that most of the people who lived in Canaan later had always lived there. That there's a, a direct progression of the, of the settlements becoming more numerous and um, just coming from within the people there from um, basically nomads who made little settlements for a while and became farmers and um, as farming became you know farming later on perhaps collapsed and there was a time when those settlements were abandoned and then they were resettled but there isn't really any evidence that there was the kind of massive um, transplant into the into the land of Israel that would account for all of Israel being sea peoples. Just the elite. Sean, I remember uh, reading that Dan was the only tribe that relocated that started in one area and then relocated. Does your does that might that possibly fit your theory of them being sea peoples? Or do you remember this? Yeah, that, that's part of what I'm talking about, as that they started off in a coastal region, much like the Philistines, which would be, you know, hey, let's send these people in their boats over to, to settle this sparsely, um, you know, this sparse kingdom and get them out of Egypt and away from our, you know, and, and they'll no longer be problematic to us. And I think that even some of them were mercenaries the pharaohs before they were resettled into Canaan. But you're not suggesting that all of Israel were uh, Philistines or sea peoples, that this was this was like a renegade people group that joined Israel, would you say? Yeah, that like perhaps one or two of the tribes were actually transplanted sea peoples but it doesn't really account for all of the settlements of, of Canaan and of all the people that later comprised Israel. So would, would we have any idea of where, like let's say we're assuming that, that they were a transplanted sea people and that they even were transplanted to that coastal region that, that the tribe of Dan was given. 
could we find out or would we know where they originally, those people originally hailed from if they had been transplanted by the Egyptians to that location, just somewhere else in Canaan? Sparta. Sparta. <clears throat> it, it does seem like at least the Philistines were Aegean transplants. Yeah. Some of these people, um, you know, my personal theory is that perhaps they were refugees or leftovers from the quote quote Trojan War. Because if you had a long protracted war between the Mycenaeans and the people that were on the Turkish peninsula at the time, you would have wiped out a lot of the noble houses. Think about Game of Thrones. And so then those whole societies would have been weakened because the people that should have taken over died in the wars. But then, in addition, you have all the mercenary groups that fought in the wars. And what are they going to do when the war is over? They don't go home. They might not even know exactly where their home was because the war has gone on for several generations. Or even if they do know, there's nothing left for them there. And so they then begin to roam around looking for new opportunities, places to settle, plunder, whatever to get by because there's no longer a war that pays their way. Now what do you guys think of the one of the arguments they made in here relating to the Sea Peoples they, they said that the generalized decline of the powerful kingdoms at the end of the late Bronze Age rather than being a result of the Sea Peoples was the sea people were in a, the, the influx of the sea peoples were an effect of that decline? Do you guys think that's right, or do you agree with that, or what do you guys think about that? Plausible. Yeah. Well, that goes along with my idea that they might be refugees from a protracted trade war, because the trade war would have created the the collapse of the Mycenaean civilization and whatever. I don't know who, who we're calling the people that would have represented Troy at the time, the people on the Turkish peninsula. But as their civilization started to crack, these people started to wander around, and then they became part of the instrument for, through which the other civilizations began to fall. Like the Hittites were, you know, they have actual archaeological evidence that the Hits were attacked by the Sea Peoples, but they also had internal problems that were going on that um, created weaknesses between in their overall empire. I think they had a lot of infighting between the royal houses and stuff. Yeah, that happens in history a lot. Um, a good example would be like the barbarians who attacked Rome. They were displaced by the by barbaric tribes that were entering their former territories and they were being displaced by people from like uh, the Mongols and stuff like that so it's like a chain reaction you know as people as one civilization collapses their refugees move in a direction and force other people out and they become you know the next wave that hits you you know later on down the line what's interesting too is there's also, you know, Shauna, you were talking about there's archaeological evidence of the Hittites being attacked, and then apparently we have it in Canaan, too, and there's even, um, I don't know if it was mentioned in this book, but from a different thing I've been listening to, um, there's Egyptian inscriptions talking about them having to fend off attacks from the Sea Peoples, too. So it seems like there was a, there were, if they were one unified group, they were pretty much attacking all over the Mediterranean seaboard, it seems like, from Egypt all the way up into Turkey. I think that since they were listed under distinct names by the Egyptian sources, I think there was like five at least that were listed, maybe more. Yeah. They are probably just groups that were using the same tactics because they were coming via the sea and attacking coastal areas. Oh, so you don't think it was like... Uh, an organized alliance or anything. Just they might have been related peoples, but and or pl plausibly maybe not. But I think uh, it just seemed like uh, separate waves of different groups of some type. I think they were um, confederations of various tribes or groups, 
And um, at, at times, I think some of them, perhaps the ones that became the Philistines, the Peleset, actually fought on the side of the Egyptians for a while and became like their mercenaries and then were granted the territory in Canaan. And uh, I, I went over here and posted this link here to pretty much everything you've ever wanted to know about the Sea Peoples that, you know, is, is available to us. And if you read through this, you'll find that some of the tribes were actually actually practiced circumcision, which would um, also fit in with some of, the, some of them having been folded into the groups of the Israelite groups. Well, I've heard too that the that the Israelites possibly, or maybe even probably, got the practice of circumcision from the Egyptians. Because uh, they practice it as well, right? I've heard that that are at least some of the priests were circumcised. Yeah, the um, again from this other thing I've been listening to about ancient Egypt, they there was one inscription or a papyrus, I forget what it was, some record of uh, the Egyptians were kind of making fun of um, captured. At the end of a, of a particular battle, I forget which one, I think it was with the Hittites, um, they were, normally they, they would, the Egyptians would cut off the right hand of all the dead uh, enemy troops and count them up at the end to, to get, you know, the record of how many they defeated. Well, in this particular case, they mentioned that they instead they cut off the penises, the uncircumcised penises of, of their enemy and... Like they were, they were put. The, the Egyptian record, like specifically pointed out, uh, ha ha ha, they're uncircumcised. You know, like they're barbarians, kind of. So, um, and then if you go back to the Hyksos thing, if there's any, if there's any connection, you know, I know it's it's really um, a loose idea, but if there's any connection between, you know, the Hyksos being the Israelites that, or if they were Israelites that left Egypt, maybe they picked up that practice while they were uh, um, in the Delta. Who knows? Didn't uh, somewhere in um, in the readings they mention circumcision that, now I can't search this PDF for that, but for um, I thought it mentioned that somewhere something strange about it or it was mentioned some it was unusual that the practice had occurred at some place or time or something I can't remember now can't lock it down hmm. yeah I don't that's not ringing the bell for me and maybe it was somewhere else then I don't remember uh, reading it either I know I remember though that Finkel Stein and in the book they're mentioning what the sea peoples might have been made up of and yeah they mentioned mercenaries refugees also pirates <laughs> different conglomerations of types of people. Arr, maybe. By the way, were the Phoenicians uh, one of the Sea Peoples? No, I believe that they were indigenous Canaanites. Yeah, that. Let me find that. Um, again, some. It's in the book. There's some. The Egyptians had mentioned who they thought comprised. I don't know if it was an exhaustive list, but they. They're like, oh, you know, the Sea Peoples, and then they listed the uh, um, Philistines and a bunch of other people. And I was, I wanted to find it too because of what Shauna had said about the, uh, what did you say, the Danoi or Dane or something like that? You said was one of the groups they had mentioned. Um, I've heard there's a group here called Denyan that are on this list, and um, I've also heard. A group called Danoi, D-A-N-O-I, which might be the same as this Denyan group here that are on this um, list on uh, that I've linked here to salambetty.com. I, I want to confess that I first got this idea about the tribe of Dan from Simba, <laughs> no, what, Simca. <laughs> if anybody knows who he is, the naked archaeologist, he comes up with some pretty wild stuff. But I, I thought that was a pretty interesting idea he had, and I've looked into it a little bit, and it it still seems to kind of make sense to me. He who shall not be named.
I found this little section. Let me just read it because it, it talks about that. So, um, the monumental inscriptions of Ramses III at the temple of Mednet Habu in Upper Egypt recount the Sea People's purported conspiracy to ravage the settled lands of the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is a quote from the inscription. The foreign countries made a conspiracy in their lands. No land could stand before their arms. They were coming forward toward Egypt while the flame was prepared before them. Their confederation was the Philistines, to Jeker, I don't, or Jeker, T-J-E-K-E-R, Shekelesh, Denyan, and Weshesh, um, lands united. They laid their hands upon the lands as far as the circuit of the earth, their hearts confident and trusting. Our plans will succeed. So I've, that's probably the inscription that's on that website, I bet. Anyway, yeah, that's really interesting theory, Shauna. That's really cool. Sounds compelling. By the way, this idea intrigues me, of course, also uh, with the... Danites being uh, sea peoples, and I, I was just wondering, do you think this may help account for the fact that Dan happened to be a center for idol worship at the time of the Golden Calf? Oh, that they were, no. that they may have been more open to idolatry than the rest of Israel. Makes sense to me. Yeah, it, it, it's compatible, at least with that idea. Possibly supportive. Um, have you guys heard any theories as to? Because it sounds like from in this chapter they were saying that that general decline of the of the kingdoms in the in the bro late Bronze Age it said that they weren't sure. Like, have you guys heard theories that you found compelling as to why that happened? I was just curious because I haven't read a lot about that other than what I just read in this book. There are sort of climate change kind of theories um, and that are related also to, I, I think, some earthquakes and volcanoes that happened at the same time. Oh, so maybe there was like a collapse of agricultural production or something like that? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. since Shauna brought that up, I was going to bring up later, I think one of the things that interests me most about this time period is the ecological destruction and the fact that you know like 10,000 years ago that entire region used to be almost entirely forest and even lots of Africa and lots of um, lots of Palestine, Lebanon, Syria those whole areas had lots and lots of forests but there was massive deforestation in the last, you know, several millennium. But I don't know the exact, you know, centuries and what the extents of the forests were, what time period. I'm trying to find that information. Now, you haven't heard the theory that um, the eruption of the island of uh, Thera, which is near Crete, was what caused the Sea Peoples to migrate because of all the different uh, climatological, geological, and so for changes to the Mediterranean basically wiped out the Minoan civilization. Hmm. And then there's other people that say, okay, and all those volcanic effects were what was recorded in the Bible as being part of the Exodus. Hmm. Of course, there can always be a perfect storm of different causes that create things to happen. It's, it's seldom in life that there's just one cause that creates you know, cataclysm. So I guess, you know, it could be a combination of things that um, that there could have been climate change and um, earthquakes, volcanoes that created problems as well as war and, you know, some other kinds of upheaval as well. Yeah, I'll have to do some more reading on that because I'm interested in that question. I don't know how definitive any of the theories out there are, but the climatic one seems really plausible. And that would explain its general character. 
I'm even curious whether we can track the timing of the um, deforestation to within centuries enough where we can look for biblical references to where certain lands were forest or desert for dating the passages. I don't know if we can get that accurate or not by that method, but it might be an interesting thing to look into. Yeah. The cool thing, too, um, I don't know how much you can tell us, was if you guys remember this inscription in the book, you probably can't even really see it, but it's ships, the Egyptians fighting the Sea Peoples, and if you look on this side, that's all the Sea Peoples, like this book's turned over, this, these are the Egyptians, and uh, like one group at the top has a really interesting headdress, like kind of like a like a plume of feathers kind of going along the top, and each boat has a different group of people inside it with different headgear, which is cool. That is the distinctive uh, headdress of the Philistines you see in all their artwork as well. Uh, okay, and then they had mentioned it in the text too, but you can see it here. You, I doubt you can see it on camera, but right over in this area, there's people with like horn helmets, and um, oh, and then another interesting little thing is like one of the 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 uh, yeah. at the ends of the ship, the beginnings of the ship. They have, uh, like, one has a lion's head, one has a, a duck's head or something like that. Anyway, just little details. I don't know enough about that time period to... Um, um, the Philistine connection is cool, but the other ones I have no idea. Maybe I'm sure archaeologists have looked into it, but it may help identify possibly who they were. One thing I thought was interesting also, Doug, uh, related to the conquest of Canaan is that these uh, stories may be somewhat of uh, the term etiology stories. Basically, yeah. these, they, they see the remains of these ruins, and this is their, uh, a story they create to account for how it happened like this. Because Jericho, for example, does have evidence of fallen uh, walls, and so I can see how they would want to create a story in the favor of their god to uh, account for that. Right, yeah. That was interesting. And I hark again harken back to um, what is that form of biblical criticism called? Is it form criticism? Form criticism usually identifies a genre of a literature and then helps an interpreter interpret once they know the form of, the, of a type of literature. Yeah. But that comes into play, which another part I found interesting was that when they were trying to come up with theories of, you know, to replace the conquest theory is that they, they noted that in Joshua it's a story of conquest, but in Judges it's a story of infiltration. So that there's mm -hmm. two, apparently two separate biblical ways of looking at the possession of the land. The other interesting thing I didn't quite understand is, you know, Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and then what is it, the Deuteron Deuteronomistic history? So that goes up to the end of Second Kings. Is that right? Yes. So if these were all composed in a short period of time by like kind of the same group of people, if you will, like, what on earth, why do we have judges telling such a different story from Joshua? That seems so weird if, if all these, if all this was coming out of, like, a, a common um, uh, well of literature, you know what I mean? It seems really, yeah, Dr. really odd. Dr. Price mentions that in, uh, I think it's the December 4th podcast, which is only available on Ustream. I don't think uh, Sergeant has put it up on the uh, RSS feed or anything like that, but he does talk about how Joshua might have been part of uh, Deuteronomic history, but then was split off and attached to uh, Deuteronomy and became a hexateuch, or there was only maybe like a tetratuch, and then it went, you know, directly to. Joshua without going to... There's different configurations that are possible. But I, because a lot of source critics 
find um, a continuity between uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, sources-wise, with Joshua, that it was probably part of the original. The, the original Pentateuch was probably just with Joshua, and Deuteronomy was a separate beginning of the Deuteronomic history that went from Deuteronomy, Judges, Kings. Can you, oh, so up, can you back up for a second? I missed what contradiction between Joshua and what else you were talking about. Judges. And what was There's, the contradiction about? It mentions the, in... Um, the Bible on Earth that there's actually two separate ways that the Bible accounts for um, the possession of the land. One is the conquest story of Joshua, the other one is more of like a in infiltration, which is like the judge's view. Okay, I get you now. Now that's the new thing. I didn't get that far in the reading, John. Uh, can you explain this infiltration idea? I Obviously I know the book of Judges, but I don't recall I certainly never read it with this this in mind. So, yeah, I never read it either. In Judges, who's infiltrating? I can't picture it. Well, source critically, you can almost go like from the end of say Deuteronomy or maybe even Numbers and leap right to the first chapter of Judges and really not lose anything because it kind of recaps. Um, the last part of the Exodus where Joshua's coming into land. But then it doesn't mention any conquest. It just goes into the period of the judges where the people are dividing up the land, the tribes are moving in, and they constantly going into apostasy with the uh, Canaanites that were never fully eradicated. <clears throat> Let me read uh, something real quick from the book, especially for your sake, Dale. Um, even before the archaeological, this is page 90, in that in chapter three, even before the archaeological findings had called the historical basis of Joshua's conquest of Canaan into question, a small circle of German biblical scholars, German biblical scholars, had been speculating about the development of Israelite literary traditions rather than battlefield strategies. As heirs to the tradition of the higher criticism of the 19th century, they pointed out the inner inconsistencies of the biblical text, which contains at least two distinct and mutually contradictory versions of the conquest of Canaan. The German scholars had always considered the book of Joshua to be a complex collection of legends, hero tales, and local myths from various parts of the country that had been, compo uh, that had been composed of over centuries. Um, actually, let me make sure I'm not reading stuff I don't have to. Sorry, I thought I was coming up on exactly what you were talking about, John. Yeah, I'm trying to lock it down, but I can't find it. It has to be somewhere in the chapter 3, somewhere. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's right around here. Yeah, it talks about many of the tales were ideological, trying to, like you said, they'll explain the ruins. Why are they there? Yeah, that was earlier. I think then they, they went into that a little bit later than that. Oh, so so the wait, the the differences you're saying are earlier in the chapter or or after that part I just read? I remember that when you were talking about the ideological character, that was pretty early in the chapter. Yeah, okay. And then later on I they, I think they went into the differences. When they started talking about the theories of um Abrecht Alt, I believe it was. That's in this section, yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's like around page 94 you were reading on my, my version of it. <clears throat> and then you just have to read, I think, further. That's all. I guess I need to read the, um, the text of Joshua and Judges itself again myself to follow this, but is there an actual contradiction there with one of them describing like the fall of one city, and then 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 later on they describing the fall of the same city again under yeah, different people. Yeah, there is because like in I don't remember. I'm trying to find the, the darn place in the book, but they had mentioned that certain cities listed as conquered by Joshua in the book of Joshua were listed as still extant in the book of Judges and had been I, captured by different means. I missed that. Okay, that's fascinating. Yeah. And also it mentions that there were cities that were supposedly wiped out 
mm-hmm. in the book of Joshua where, you know, they're just like happily going along <laughs> as if nothing ever happened. There are right. a lot of layers to Judges, right? I mean, I think the Song of Deborah is considered one of the oldest passages uh, in, in the Bible, whereas other parts of the book are not quite as old as that. Yeah, that's what that little section I was talking about. How they had a, they had said that uh, Joshua would be a collection of legends, hero tales, local myths. So yeah, it seems like a composite work of a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I do know that Joshua says that they conquered the entire promised land, and then you know you start reading later on, and there's all these pockets of stuff that's left that wasn't conquered. Oh, um, is there is there any reason to note that there's a similarity between the names Josiah and Joshua, and that Joshua's even could considered to be kind of a late pasted on sort of character? Because, you know, he's not there when Moses is doing all his stuff, and then all of a sudden Moses, yeah, yeah, there's this guy Joshua, and he's going to do the one to, con- to conquer the promised land because I'm not going to, I'm going to die, and I'm not going to make it over. And so it seems like maybe Joshua, I mean, could be just sort of like a character created during the time of Josiah and pasted onto the legends to boost, you know, Josiah's personal propaganda. Um, I'm not sure if those names are similar. I want to ask Reuven about that. What's the meaning of the name Joshua and the meaning of the name Josiah? I always thought Joshua meant like Yahweh is Savior. And I thought in names like Isaiah and stuff that end with Yah, it's something Yah. But, but so I if, think Joshua, if Josiah is the same name, it would have Yah on both halves of the word, which seems odd to me. Maybe not the same name, but sounding really similar. You know what I mean? That's not the point. The point of it was that, um, you know, these were romances of the time of Josiah, that they were like, you know, metaphorical, symbolic of the time of Joshua because it fit in more with the archaeology of that period than it did when it was allegedly set. By the way, Reuben's commenting Josiah in Hebrew, Yoshi Yahu. The term Yahu is the divine name, just like at the end of Joshua. They both have the have God's name at, at the end of it. Yeah, they sound the same. They Joshua sound has it at the beginning, not the end, though. One yeah, has Yo- Josiah, Yeshua. In Joshua, the divine name's at the beginning of it. Yah Shua. Yah saves. And then Yosiah. And that is supported by Yah, with the Yah at the end of it. That's why I'm confused by the similarity. Well, it may be not that they're not that they're maybe not similar just by the the meaning of the name, but maybe just even the sounds of the names, you know, that could be a hint. Because that's what they're arguing in this book is that yeah. that that the uh, this Deuteronomistic history period was the Josiah King Josiah basically, and yeah, what what Shauna said fits right into that. That this is, and they even talk about it like yeah, this whole this whole story in in the book of Joshua is really kind of. In addition to being partly ideological to explain like the these fallen down walls of Jericho and stuff like that, it's also like political propaganda that's trying to say, hey, um, we were we can conquer all these lands again, you know, if we just if we we can have God on our side if we only you know follow the commandments and don't go after foreign gods, etc. Yeah, yes, Sean. I, when I was reading it, I did notice that similarity. There's one thing I wanted to search that Shauna had mentioned too about Joshua kind of coming out of nowhere in the book of, at the end of Book of Deuteron- Deuteronomy. Um, By the way, I've heard more. 
I have the impression that several of these characters may be based on Josiah. I've read that, for example, Moses and Joshua may have been based on him, particularly the idea that, like, the Book of the Law was discovered at the, during his reign. Isn't that the case? So-called discovered, quote-unquote, uh, in the temple. And almost as if that's when the law was given. <laughs> yeah, the Book of the Law yeah, was discovered. That. Yeah. And his ex yeah. His, uh, he was an expansionist king, so uh, comparing him to Joshua. Actually, I guess we're assuming that Deuteronomy and the Deuteronomistic history was actually, the, or some version of those were the books that were, quote, quote, discovered yeah. in, during the reign of Josiah. Yeah, that's the basic premise of this book is that uh, a lot of the stuff fits that period if it's historical. Mm -hmm. That was the other thing I wanted to talk about, too, was just like in the case of the book of Genesis with talking about the patriarchs and, you know, where the, where events are happening and what the conditions are, uh, some of the side details, they're saying, it, you know, it's more in line with, with 7th century, right? Yeah. Um, history than it is with whatever, however long ago the patriarchs supposedly happen in the story. And then again, same thing with um, the Exodus books, that the, those historical details jive better with that same period, Josiah's period. And here again, Conquest of Canaan um, talks about the same thing, like the, the particular historical setting that they're describing seems to be more um, in agreement with the same time period than it does with the ostensible time period of the, of the events described. By the way, I'd like to bring up something related to that. Um, all of this to suggest that this whole story was created in the seventh century, and yet um, the one the one little problem that I see is that there are two prophets at least, Amos and Hosea, that are kings from the northern kingdom of Israel from the 8th century, so a century earlier, who are aware of a tradition that Israel, you know, out of Egypt I called my son. In other words, Israel came from Egypt. It doesn't actually say there were slaves, but that basically God brought them out of it, is Egypt and even mentions that they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And this, apparently, long before the book of Exodus was written, I'm just wondering, how do you guys, how should we make sense of that? Where did this tradition, if it, if it dates so early, unless you can say that, I, that Amos and Hosea might be later creations and not 8th century. Well, Amos and Hosea are from Israel, if I'm not mistaken, which would be northern traditions and we were talking about earlier how the whole sea peoples thing as being a kernel of um, of, of Egypt, uh, you know of a remembrance of, of some kind of a of, of coming in from Egypt would go along with that so that it, it would be long it would pre you know and the sea peoples came in 200 years before Amos and Hosea so the idea that there was some kind of a kernel of these stories um, circulating around is not problematic to what's being proposed in the book. What's being proposed in the book is that these books were um, possibly, you know, like rewrites or um, that old stories were knitted together in a new fashion to make them um, fit with the propaganda of the age of Josiah. Well, Finkelstein and Silberman are suggesting that these, if there is a historical truth behind it, of course, as far as I read it, they're not comparing it to the Sea People's experience, but to the Hyksos, the Canaanites experience as the Hyksos in Egypt, that that's the reason that accounts for the memory that exists in Canaan of this sort of national experience that they had in Egypt and were expelled. I think pretty much explode the Hyksos theory in this book, especially when they start talking about 
how the how the Armarna letters um, completely blew away any kind of idea that there that the the Hicksos actually represent um, uh, the the history of the people of Israel in any way. Is this DJ Murdoch? DM Murdoch? No. Oh, <laughs> what book are you talking about? Are you talking about Bible and Earth? Yeah, I'm talking about Bible and Earth. Um, I mean, he talks extensively about what the 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 Amarna letters have to say about the early the early history of Canaan, and there's no way that the Hicksus are that the Exodus of the Hicksus really has anything to do with 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 Moses and and the Exodus at all. Well, I don't think that they believe that um, Moses, you know, that Moses was a historical figure or anything. But I do think that they, they, Doug, you remember this? That they specifically say that they think that that's the reason for the uh, the tradition. By the way, I thought you had said, <laughs> Shauna, when you spoke, I thought you had said that I, I thought you said I discount that whole Hicksos Hicksos theory in my book. That's why I thought for a second that you were D.M. Murdoch. <laughs> Sorry, no, 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 I'm not D.M. Murdoch, and I did not write a book. I, I I don't know. I've had a few glasses of wine, maybe. Maybe I got a little slurred as I was talking. <laughs> no problem. Um, to me, it seems like they were, in this book, from what I, I might have to go back and reread it, but it seems like they were saying that, yeah, the Exodus story as we're reading in the Bible is not the Hyksos story. For one thing, the dating's way off, and a bunch of other problems, too. Uh, specifically, what happened? I mean, the Hyksos seem to have come in gradually and have somehow taken over the region. Egyptian records say the same thing. Egyptians kicked them out. Um, kind of all at once, but again, the dating's all wrong. But it seems to me like that, that Finkelstein and Silverman were at least open to the possibility that the Exodus story as we have it is like a highly mythologized, I guess, if you will, or, or with a big legendary veneer over it. Possibly the kernel of memory there was possibly from what the Hyksos thing, because there was a lot of... Conne they, they, they stressed the the point that the Hyksos seem to have been a Semitic people. Um, but again, it, it's not the Exodus story. They, they were definitely certain about that. But the, the, but the, I don't see why anyone has to, be st has to stumble over the little trappings like the dating or whether they really were slaves, for example. The only <laughs> question is, was this pure fiction or does it originate with some sort of kernel of truth, you know. Right. What one issue I see is is that we don't even have to have them traveling for them to leave Egypt. Because basically Egypt left them in, in a certain way. I mean Egypt used to rule that land centuries before and then when it kind of shrunk down and no longer ruled that their area. I mean so you could have ancestors that were Egyptians living you know, near your own home that you know, hundreds of years later, are no longer an Egyptian Egyptian province, and people could have memories of that and misinterpreted it. Well, the other thing that's important too, that like I mentioned earlier, the circumcision thing. Did the Jews get that from Egypt? And if if the Hyksos were Semitic peoples, they could have picked it up in that in that event. And then there's so, there's such a connection. Well, the other thing too is the Egyptians, you know, like controlled Canaan for a long time, so they could have picked it up there too. So it's not necessarily tied to that. But um, yeah, going off what Dale said. Go oh, ahead. sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna say that yeah, I don't think we need every detail to line up in order to at least say that it could possibly be based off of that. The story of Exodus being written way later and obviously placed at a time too far back in time to be even historically plausible as described but that was the, the, but that that cultural memory if you will was kind of a 
a framework for the Exodus story. Right, and I just want to bring up one thing that I had posted in the Bible Geek uh, listeners section of Facebook. Uh, I don't know if you had seen it, but uh, when I was reading through Finkelstein and Silberman, and they were talking about how at the at the at the dating in the 1200s that many of these cities didn't have walls. For example, Jericho. Yeah. But I remember back when I was a Christian, <laughs> distinctly remembering that there were that Jerusalem was had walls at one time, and, and that archaeologists found these walls had fallen down. I mean, you know, these are the things that apologists point out, you know. So the question that I had was, well, when did when do they date those things? And it just so happens that the walls of Jericho that have been fallen down for whatever reason, whether an earthquake or whatever, have been dated to around 1550, and the Hyksos Exodus was 1570, just yeah. 20 years earlier. And so I had proposed, is there, do you think there's a connection? Is this just a coincidence, or could could they be responsible for attacking Jericho? Like, that was the one one city that they actually did attack when they came back? Or, I don't know, I just uh, wondered about it. <laughs> it's a possibility, but yeah, who knows. Well, the book does say that um, during that period there was no... Oh, maybe that was earlier. No, forget about it. Um, I have to step away for just a second, guys, but um, uh, I was trying to leave you with something to talk about. But anyway, talk about whatever. I'll be right back. Talk amongst yourselves. Well, th the same thing that the book says uh, about like the memories of earlier things, they also b basically make the same argument for things like Joshua and uh, also David later in the... Uh, I think it was the uh, fifth chapter, Memories of a Golden Age. So their whole theme per chapter is that there is like a historical kernel. So how they put it here, like in, uh, I have it on page, I guess, 92, it says, um, such searing experiences like destructions of cities and slaughter of inhabitants clearly occurred. Such searing experiences are not likely to have been totally forgotten and indeed their once vivid memories growing progressively vaguer over the centuries may have become the raw material for a far more elaborate retelling. Thus there is no reason to suppose that the burning of Hatzor by hostile forces for example never took place but what was in actuality a chaotic series of upheavals caused by many different factors and carried out by many different groups became many centuries later a brilliantly crafted saga of territorial conquest under God's blessing and direct command. The literary production of that saga was undertaken for purposes quite different from the commemoration of local legends mainly at what follows after that is applying it to the period of Josiah. Right, that makes sense in taking previous events and rewriting the reasons behind them. And by the way, I do want to mention, I, I've also I've been thinking about why is it that when I posted this about the Hyksos, right after we had our discussion then I posted something about, oh, this was an interesting point that the Hyksos, the authors thought that that was the kernel of truth behind the... Uh, the Exodus story, and then somebody wrote, well, then if they really were, if the Canaanites really were rulers in Egypt for a while, then why doesn't the Bible story tell that? Wouldn't that be an important thing not to overlook? But as I was thinking it over, at least I want to throw it out to you guys, it seems to me that the intention of the author or authors in creating this story is to try to kind of obligate the people to worship Jehovah alone. And so they create this situation where Israel is in such a, a situation they need to be saved from. So they are slaves. Jehovah saves them. And then all of a sudden, every constantly, all the prophets relate, refer to this event and saying, basically, you owe your allegiance to Jehovah alone because he brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slaves. So that suddenly creating that story, reinventing it, making them slaves that were rescued, 
makes them all obligated to serve him as their one god, that seems to me why they would reinvent a story from where they had been kings and were forced out of the land to where they were slaves and were rescued through the miracles of God. Does that, does that make any sense? Uh, the book is talking a lot about the message of, say, like Judges, where the people, as long as they're faithful to the law of Moses, everything's cool, but they constantly lap into apostasy. They're attacked and subdued by their pagan neighbors. Then when they truly repent and call on, on uh, God's help, he raises up a judge who delivers them. And the cycle keeps repeating over and over through the entire book. But isn't that kind of like the entire Old Testament from the time that they're uh, released from Egypt? They're, you know, they're out in the desert, and then they complain. They get punished. They repent. Then, you know... God shows them favor, he feeds them, whatever. And it's a constant cycle. And then and same through with uh, the Deuteronomic history and kings. You have bad kings, they do bad stuff, they get attacked by enemies, and, you know, if they're followed by a good king and everything's cool. So it's like this constant cycle that's not just confined to one book. It seems to be the entire saga of the Old Testament is basically that pattern. Yeah. yeah. The thing I want to throw in here is your talking about the memory of, you know, if any of the, I forgot how to phrase it, but if any of the Jewish ancestors, I guess, um, were rulers in, in Egypt, like from the Hyksos and things. Um, well, the Genesis does describe Joseph ruling in Egypt. I was just going to say that, yeah. And um, the memory is there, if you want to call it a memory. The other thing, too, that, that's in Joseph, that they, that they go down, that his brothers go down, or sent down by Jacob to buy grain because of a famine, that's exactly what the, they were talking about in Bible on Earth, about a re, part of the reason why they think the Hyksos had been migrating in waves from Canaan to Egypt you know, throughout the decades because there were periodic famines that would bring more and more immigrants from these, like, impoverished areas of Canaan experiencing famine down into Egypt and they slowly just accumulated and somehow ended up becoming rulers essentially. I mean we, there's even Egyptian records of of you know the Hyksos obviously ruled in the Delta for a period of time. And if you wanna say that names sound similar again, Joseph and Josiah also sound similar just as similar as Joshua and Josiah are to me. Mm, I don't think they're probably, as similar. Probably no there. connection, but I mean, because they just have the divine name, and that's why they seem similar. Yeah. In English. But yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, though. Like, I don't think there has to be a one-to-one -one correlation between some historical event and some fictional story later on in order for you to, for, in order to say that there's maybe some kind of um, connection of influence or something like that, you know? And if you think about, like, the Hyksos thing is real, it doesn't seem crazy to me to say that, you know, that would have been a big cultural or ethnic memory, you know, that, that they probably would have hung on to, you know. But yeah, John, you said in English, but that was kind of my point earlier, is I think the similarity between Josiah and, jo and Joseph and Joshua is mostly just in English also. I, it just doesn't, the limited knowledge I have of Hebrew, I don't see him as being that similar in Hebrew. Reuben might tell me otherwise, but... But well, even if they were practically identical, you know, that only go, takes you so far. Yeah. Oh, so Josiah is Yosh Yoshiyahu. That's the Hebrew spelling, uh, Reuben. <laughs> so Yoshiyahu, Yesh Yehoshua, Yoshiyahu Yehoshua. Yeah, they're they're pretty similar. I mean, that 
It's just interesting, that's all. Okay, so, um, I cannot find that part. But that was the gist of it, uh, Wayne, about the, uh, oh, no, I did find it. Uh, John, it's actually at the beginning of um, the next chapter, so this will be a great segue. Who are the Israelites? Um, once the great conquest, this is at the beginning of chapter 4, page 97. Once the great conquest of Canaan was completed, the book of Joshua related in great detail how the Israelite leader divided the land, now mostly cleared of, ind of the indigenous Canaanite population among the victorious Israelite tribes as their eternal inheritances. Yet within the book of Joshua and the following book of Judges are some serious contradictions to this picture of the tribes inheriting the entire land of Israel. Although the book of Joshua at one point declares as, <clears throat> excuse me, that the Israelites had taken possession of all the land God promised and had defeated all their enemies, Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 and 44, other passages in the book of Joshua and in the book of Judges make it clear that many Canaanites and Philistines lived in close proximity to the Israelites. Um, maybe that's not the part. <laughs> I think it's getting there, though. Yeah. Do you remember if it was in Chapter 4? Uh, could have been. Oh, yeah, here we go. This is it. Okay. Okay, yeah, so with that last migration, he's talking about the tribes going off to their different, or what? getting their, their different inheritances. This is page 99. Um couple pages into chapter 4. Um, with that last migration, the map of the Holy Land was set, or was it, in a puzzling contradiction to the proclamations of total victory, the book of Joshua reports that large territories within Canaan situated outside the tribal inheritances remained to be conquered. They included, quote, all the regions of the Philistines along the southern coast of the country, the Phoenician coast farther north, and the area of the Becca Valley, if I'm saying that right, in the northeast, Joshua chapter 13, verse 1 through 6. The book of Judges goes even further, listing important unconquered Canaanite enclaves in the territory of over half of the tribes. The great Canaanite cities of the coastal plain and the northern valleys, such as Megiddo, Beth Sheen, Dor, and Gezer, were listed in the book of Judges as uncaptured, even though their rulers were included in the book of Joshua and its list of defeated Canaanite kings. In addition, the Ammonites and Moabites dwelling across the Jordan River remained hostile, and the violent Midianites and Amalekite camel raiders from the desert were always a threat to the people of Israel, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, that's, that's that part I was remembering, or that, that John had mentioned. That made me think of something just now. Um, they were talking about the origins... I think later in this chapter, of the Israelites. Um, and the, fi the theory that they favor is that they're basically Canaanites who are nomadic Bedouin types, sheep herders, pastoral people, that in times of st stress where they can't get material like grains and stuff from the settled peoples in the lowlands, they end up being semi-sedentary uh, and start farming and then eventually because it becomes difficult to be both nomadic and past, uh, pastoral and agricultural, they end up settling. And then they, they mentioned there were several instances of this happening back and forth where they would go back to being pastoral. They go back. But it's a pattern that repeats at least three times. So, you know, but they were basically saying that, you know, these were indigenous peoples that eventually they became the Israelites because they, you know, because of interrelationships between the villages and the peoples um, that they wanted to develop a distinct identity apart from other people and they had good relations with the settled peoples because they would have they would work for them they would uh, their animals would be allowed to pasture 
in the farm areas of the lowland settled communities. But then what they, you just read was mentioning that, you know, during this time of settlement when it's now the Israelites who are in charge, that those same peoples from which they more or less originated, the same types of peoples, Midianites and that kind of desert dwelling people, are antagonistic and enemies. So it just seems like a conscious why is there a difference between their period when they were fulfilling that role as on the outskirts and margins of Canaanite society, why those people don't fulfill the same roles as part of Israelite society. I might be misunderstanding you here, but are you saying that why weren't they, like, for example, the Ammonites and Moabites undergoing the same mm, process? No, no, more like, uh, well, I'm, the theory of origins of the Israelites were that they yeah. were they, they were like the Midianites and those pastoral people living on the margins in the arid areas to the east, and that they would interact with the settled Canaanite populations that are now being inhabited by the Israelite communities. But why is it that when they were pastoral and semi-nomadic and then agricultural, did they have better relations with the Canaanite settled peoples because they're exchanging goods, grains, that kind of stuff, than the people who were fulfilling that same role when they were the settled peoples in the land? Why are the Amalekites and those other people seen as so antagonistic as enemies rather than, you know, sometimes uh, it mentioned that they are often employed by the Canaanite uh, city dwellers. They were allowed to use their lands for, for rummaging, uh, you know, rumination for their flocks. Um, they exchanged grain and other materials that they couldn't get. They also received from the nomads uh, dairy products and stuff like that from sheep and goat herding. So there was like a symbiotic relationship between them. But why is it characterized later on as a non-symbiotic relationship when it's the Israelites who are inhabiting the land? Well, weren't they saying that up to a certain point in time, even these nomadic people were still... Canaanites. I mean, they weren't. They wouldn't have considered themselves separate peoples up to a certain, except up to a certain point in time. Wasn't that that they're arguing? Because there were several of these back and forth, going more pastoral or more agricultural phases. But the, you know, they were still the same people essentially. And then up to a certain point, they start saying, you know, oh, now we're not. There's no uh, pig bones, for example, in the uh, rubbish tips of these. Uh, tells and stuff like that. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying that once the Israelites had a, a settled identity taking over right. the lands, that they were then much more exclusivist than the peoples that they dealt with when they were semi-nomadic, is what you're saying. Well, that's how I read what they were saying, was that yeah, okay. for a long time they, they wouldn't have really considered themselves separate except in the case where obviously they were living out in these these different cities, you know, but they were still trading with them, but they probably culturally and well, ethnically at least probably recognize that hey, we're the same as these people, we just have a different lifestyle. But then well, eventually they they had kind of really become separated. But the the stuff with the Amalekites and Moabites and the talking about in the book of Judges still being a threat, um that's that's being described from at least going off the theory of the book from like the time of Josiah. So they wouldn't and also be just recounting the actual history of Israelites, if you will. Yeah. But also you can look at it from the perspective that the Amalekites were actually like different types of people. That uh, the Ammonites and Moabites were Canaanites living in within the confines of what they would consider Israelite territory and still, you know, bad influence, uh, antagonistic relationships. But Midianites and so forth might have been seen as different people. Arabs, for instance, you know, non-Canaanites. So yes, yeah, could be, yeah. And then, like I said, eventually they did have their own identity. So then they could, then again, they could say, hey, look at these Canaanites. They eat pigs. They worship idols, blah, 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 blah. Um, is there any evidence that anyone ate pigs besides the Philistines and the Aegean transplants? Because 
Um, you know, the, the Midianites and the people that they mention actually inhabited a little bit different territory than the people that are known now as Israelites. And they're described as that there, there are waves of settlement where there, uh, there's a period of time where they're more pastoral, which matches the time when there were more cities. And then there were times when they grew their own grain and had more settled times where they had a, and, and during those times they had a combination of pastoral, that is the herding of animals, and agriculture because they talked about them having the ringed communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. It didn't say it was the only so distinctive. So we're talking about the same people that are going through various phases, but then the places where they're finding the pig bones are like Philistine cities, and in fact, cities in general. And I well, not only that, it, wouldn't yeah. they say that there was like also highland settlement settlements that were typically, by whatever criteria that they were dis distinguishing them, they were non-Israelite. They had pig bones. It was just this certain section that they said were like the forerunners of the Israelites that had that one particular distinctive is that they did not eat or raise pigs. Right. Um, I, I think I would like to see evidence of where the pastoral highlands people had um, pig bones because the, the very fact is that you can't raise pigs in that kind of an environment. You don't, sheep and goats will form herds and people can lead them around or drive them around in the pasture and take them to places where they can have water and feed and can bring them back to a place where they're safe at night. And this has gone on for thousands of years. But pigs do not work that way. Yeah, I didn't go into any detail, but I'm thinking maybe when they became less pastoral and more settled, they took to uh, raising pigs, maybe got them from other peoples around there. But certain groups didn't do that at all, didn't eat them, didn't raise them. Well, I'm going to, I would think that probably your Israelite people are the ones who were pastoral people and that the, um, the pig people were the ones that were from cities or from sea peoples that um, raised animals in confined conditions. Yeah, but that wasn't my impression of what the book was saying. I was saying the entire Highland people had a certain basic pattern that applied to all of them except for one thing and that certain certain ones did not mess with pigs. So that, that was my impression. I could be wrong, but that seemed like it was what the book was saying. We can look at that again, but I think you'll find that they decided that the ones that had pigs were the Philistine cities and that they were not... It mentioned that, yeah. It mentioned that the lowland peoples, all those indigenous Canaanites, every one of them had no problem with pork. And that would go along with them being a GN transplant. Well, that clinches it. Um, I'm trying to find this spot where it talks about the pig bones. Yeah, here we go. Um, so again, there were these settlements of shifting between more pastoral, more agricultural, in general happening, but the, the, the distinctive thing for the Israelite, I guess that's how you define them as Israelite, because there's no other distinguishing factor other than the absence of pig bones. Um, uh, bone assemblage, this is page 119, chapter 4. Bone assemblages from earlier highland settlements did contain the remains of pigs. So remember, same people. These are people, the earlier settlements in the same spot. They had pig bones, but then, you know, you can go through the different layers of these ruins as they're, you know, once, as they become more pastoral, they're not necessarily settled in that same spot. They're m moving around more. And then as they become more agricultural, they go back to that same settlement and kind of be more permanent or whatever you want to call it. Oh, anyway, let me continue. 
Bone assemblages from earlier highland settlements did contain the remains of pigs, and the same is true for later post-Iron Age settlements there. But throughout the Iron Age, the era of the Israelite monarchies, pigs were not cooked and eaten or even raised in the highlands. Comparative data from the coastal Philistine settlements of the same period, the Iron Age I, show a surprisingly large number of pigs represented among the recovered bones. Though the early Israelites did not eat pork, the Philistines clearly did, as did, uh, parentheses, as best we can tell from the sketchier data, the Ammonites and Moabites east of the Jordan. So it seems like up to a, up to a certain point in time, everyone's eating pig bones the, in these settlements, regardless of where they're at. But then eventually they start to see that the highland settlements, they stop finding pig bones at, at certain le the more recent layers. Am I reading that right? Is that, that's the impression I'm getting. I wonder um, at, at what point um, the fact, the, the disconnection with the Egyptians um, related to the disappearance of the pig bones. Oh, the timing of that? Right. What do you mean disconnecting with the Egyptians, like them not having well, as big of an influence in Canaan? Exactly. Um, as what we call the collapse of the Bronze Age, you know, yeah. Egypt, Egypt's influence waned or pretty much disappeared in Canaan for a while. But prior to that, um, you know, basically the, the cities paid tribute to Egypt and that they, they were kind of tax collection centers for Egypt. And I, I think that might be one of the reasons they didn't have walls at those times is because hey, the Egyptians were providing the security and they didn't want these various kings to get to the point where they could defend themselves from the Egyptian um, occupation of that area. The book actually says that. Yeah. Do you remember they also yeah, talked they about the theory? Yeah, they Godfather Protection Service. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a theory that they had mentioned, and they didn't discount it, and they, but they just basically presented it, was that once these distinctive peoples... Uh, you know, were differentiating themselves by certain customs, like for not eating pork, that there was an influx, and I thought it mentioned something of some ideas from Egypt, some maybe some small group that came in and brought, you know, a higher kind of monotheistic, or not, maybe not, maybe just a higher ethical standard, and mixed with those same peoples, and that kind of gave birth to a, a further distinctiveness amongst these people. So it just mentions that. But it doesn't go into any detail, and it doesn't refute it either, though. By the way, so I didn't. I have to apologize. I hadn't read this chapter. I only read chapter three. But are you guys? So I'm trying to piece together what you guys are saying. Uh, are they suggesting then that at, at some point some of the Canaanites decided to um, join some sort of confederation? and leaving out other Canaanite people groups, and they are the ones that adopted this monotheistic religion and excluding other Canaanites who didn't want to opt in, or, and what caused this sort of situation? What's, what's the suggestion? Well, the, like we were saying earlier, at some point, you know, you had all these these more rural settlements happening and it just so happens that at a particular point in time you stop finding pig bones um, in the earlier layers or the later layers of these um, the ruins of these settlements in the highland settlements um, and that's the only thing that they can distinguish them from say the other ones that were further south or whatever uh, and they said that, I think they said that they don't really know why that distinction started happening. They don't know what caused it, but there seems to have been some, obviously some development, slow development of like a, of a distinctive identity by these highland rural settlements. Can they date that change then? Um, I think they can because, I mean, they're... I don't know how ac how specifically accurate they can get, and I don't actually don't remember them putting dates on when the 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 pig bones start disappearing. Uh, 
Yeah, they didn't never pinned it down to an actual date. Right. Um, and this was happening from the these settlements were going on from the early Bronze Age to the late Iron Age too. So from 3500 BC all the way up to 586 BC, we had these settlements happening. Uh, what what I was kind of trying to say is that when they stopped having extensive trade with the Egyptians and the kind of civilization where there were large cities and places where they could sustain confined spaces to grow pigs that the people who turned pastoral gave up the pigs because that it didn't go with their lifestyle and then when they come back together later to become agricultural they don't have pigs anymore they don't really need them and so it, it wasn't really like oh we're not going to eat pigs anymore because God said we shouldn't eat pigs it was just part of the lifestyle part of the lifestyle of the people um, in the highlands and who, that, who were um, nomadic animal herders that they no longer kept pigs or used them. Well, I think that some, pe some people did when they returned to a more settled life did retake up doing pigs but I could see where what you're saying it could be just like a historical accident that one group when they came back from uh, being you know more nomadic and had to start settling down that they just didn't bother, you know. It just could have been nothing deliberate. It just could have been eh, just the way it is. Though yeah. at some point in time, they did have a prohibition against eating pork. But the, there are, of course, biblical minim minimalists say that that those prohibitions may not have come in until the Persian time, when the uh, because pigs are kind of weird animals that. Um, have hooves but aren't ruminants and, um, and and so the prohibition of eating pork goes along with the the idea of not mixing seeds and yeah. um, other other things so and it may have been that they just sort of dovetailed at that point but also there's another thing about pigs that a lot of people don't realize is that they were the garbage disposals of the ancient world so like in cities and places where they had, uh, you know, like bodies to get rid of, you know, of criminals and just general, like, nastiness, they, you know, they would throw all this stuff to the pigs and the pigs would eat them. And so it could also be that people out in the country didn't have that same kind of need and may have actually had kind of a distaste for the idea of eating such an animal. Um, so you think you are what you eat? Shauna, do you think that all of the clean, unclean distinctions may have been adopted in the Persian era? Well, that's what the minimalists claim. I'm, you know. I, What's the dates of that era? Oh, that's much later. That would be yeah, like, like five, eight, five eighties. Exile the um the time during Babylon and afterward. Actually, the, per the Persians were the ones that replaced the Babylonians and actually sent the Israelites back to their home, allegedly. Yeah. I, I don't discount the possibility that a lot of that stuff is codification of practices that were already going on that we're, now we're coming up with a justification for it. That's always possible. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because these settlements without pig bones are way older than that time period. Um, and it, I don't know if it was just a lack of availability because they're, the neighbors all were eating pigs, you know, because they're, they're finding through the entire course of these tells of these rural settlements, and so those southern ones, they're, they're a bunch of the, the neighboring ones, they all have pig bones all the way through with all the layers. So those are the ones that they're identifying as being Philistine. Not in the highlands, no. Well, no, the highlands ones they say are, have have left the pig bones behind by a certain period. Not all of them. Not all the settlements. Yeah, I'm not clear on that exactly. Um, it, There's another thing, though. It's like the tendency of the book. It's um, when they kind of at the end say, when a when a, a Jewish person, you know. Uh, 
does not eat pork as part of his uh, Jewish heritage, that he's doing one of the most oldest practices of you know Israelite tradition, mm -hmm. and it sometimes makes me think that there is kind of like a, a nationalist bias that runs through this book in some cases. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. What kind seems of bias? To be very, uh, uh, nationalist I think there are bias. Of archaeologists that took settlements and said, "Well, there's pig bones here, so it wasn't Israelites. There are." Yeah. And there aren't pig bones here, so it must have been Israelite. And that there was so little difference in the pot pottery that sometimes they decided that that was the big distinction. And you know, I I don't know. Um, just on the Highlands thing. Bone assemblages from earlier Highland settlements did contain the remains of pigs, and the same is true for later post-Iron Age settlements there. But throughout the Iron Age, the era of the Israelite monarchies, pigs were not cooked and eaten or even raised in the Highlands. So are they saying, because the first sentence doesn't seem compatible with the second sentence, because there's the first sentence is saying, the same is true for later post Iron Age settlements there, where in the Highlands. But then it's saying, but throughout the Iron Age, the era of the Israelite monarchies, pigs were not cooked and eaten or even raised in the Highlands. Does that seem like a contradiction? Well, it depends on what what time period you're talking about. What is Iron Age? What is Iron Age to? I mean that that's beyond. Yeah, it doesn't specify in those cases. It just says post Iron Age and then Iron Age. It's, it's not in this particular set of two sentences. It's not dividing it up one, two, three, or whatever. Yeah, post Iron Age isn't that usually Hellenistic? Mm-hmm. So that's it's, way past the scope of what we're really talking about in this book, or. Well, that's what they're saying here. They're saying the same is true. That is the the pig bones are found. The same is true for later post-Iron Age settlements there in the Highlands. So post-Iron Age would would be um, like Babylonian and possibly Persian times, so the, the, it isn't really what we're talking about here. Okay, I see what you're saying. I thought they were saying that, well, some of the settlements in the Highlands had pig bones the whole way through, no matter where, what layer you look at. But you're saying that that all the settlements in the Highlands in a certain window of time had no pig bones. But after the Iron Age, we start seeing pig bones coming back. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's how I'm understanding that passage. Yeah. Yeah, because I was trying to see if they had anything to say about what John was saying that that there were possibly highland there, there were possibly some settlements in the Highlands that were eating pigs th all the way through, and I don't know if I can't tell if they are saying anything like that in here or not. I don't know, but that would be interesting because that would that would tell us something about if availability was a factor because obviously if some built if some settlement like a few miles away is eating pigs while well, these ones practically right next door aren't well obviously availability of pigs is not and, but, and think, about, think about country mouse versus city mouse and that we're talking about groups of people who are um, distinguishing themselves from others. Mm -hmm. So we have this group of pastoral nomadic people who sometimes grow grain and they just don't really have pigs that much. They had them at one time when they were trading with the um, Canaanite cities that were you know, fed by the Egyptians but they're gone now so they don't really do that. And then you've got these Philistines who move in and they have cities and they also have pigs and so it's one of those things that come out to be um, like I guess um, I forgot who it was that were getting impressions who had their big buttons. Maybe it was the um, the pre Amish types. But I guess you know they say, okay, well, you know we're the 
we're the shepherds and you know we have this culture and then there's these intruders over here the Philistines and they brought in their pigs and you know their other customs and so it becomes a line of demarcation become between the cultures that was actually just kind of there because it was naturally a part of the cultures and not because of some kind of a, a religious injunction yeah that's where I might be reading it a little differently. I see what you're saying, and that's a possibility. The only thing is, like, this is what I was looking for. Like, this map, I don't know if you can see it that well, but this white area is the highlands, and all these dots are these are these settlements that they're talking about. Now, there were settlements. They don't mark them out, but there were settlements in the lowlands on either side of this central highlands region. Same type of settlements where if you look at the tells, you're getting a shift between more or less pastoral, more or less agricultural. That's happening across the map in all these settlements. But at some point in time, all the settlements in this highland region stop, or maybe not all, I can't, that's not clear from the text, but some at least of these highland regions are not eating pig bone, bones after a certain point. But these ones, settle, same types of settlements, these ones are eating them all the way through, whereas these ones, at least some of them, have stopped. So if these guys, you know, why why couldn't these guys have access to pigs, whereas these guys could? You see what I'm saying? I don't know if that makes sense. But, like, some of these settlements are, like, I mean, practically right on the border between the lowlands and the islands. You know it depends I mean? on, on what kind of agriculture and animal raising you're doing. When you're up in the hills, you have sheep and goats, and you take them out in little herds. They have a little home that you bring them to every evening, but every day you take them out, and they wander around along a little certain path, and they go, and, and you take them to the places where they have grazing and water, and they follow you around, and you can bring them back. But you can't do that with pigs. But then, why did they ever have them? You see what I'm saying in that in this well, Highlands region. They had they had the pigs at those times because they may have traded with the people in the city and brought the pigs in and kept them in confined spaces, and that they were perhaps organized enough to keep them in confined spaces. But once you have to abandon your cities and you have to move into a totally nomadic way of life. You can't take the pigs with you. Yeah, because they're not conducive to that traveling. The only other thing, too, that I remember, though, is that it wasn't... There weren't just two phases of their pastoral, 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 pastoral. Okay, now they're, now they're agricultural. Or, I'm sorry, the opposite. Agriculture, agriculture. Okay, pastoral. It was a cycle going back and forth over this, these long periods of time. When they, at a certain point, when, when, they've, left, when they've left the cities behind, the, the, the Egyptian civilization behind, and they come back together again, and they make their, their agriculture, they have, to have, they have to bring in some cattle in order to plow. Yeah. But they don't need to bring in the pigs anymore. It's no longer, they're no longer something that they that they need to trade and bring in, and so they just don't. But it sounds, like, it sounds like what they're saying, though, is that even once the pig bones stop showing up in these highland settlements, you're still getting that pastoral agricultural cycle happening, even yeah, after the pig bones yes, stop. But what you're dealing with is the people who have always lived there versus people who are transplants. And the people who are transplants, the, the Philistines, for instance, are the ones who have brought in the pigs, and that's why you're having the conflict between the various groups. And that's why you have the, pig, you have the pork eating as being one of the distinctions between the groups. Oh, so what you're saying is these highland settlements had people coming in from the lowlands up to a certain point and then once that 
that that mixing stopped, eventually the Highland settlements developed a distinct identity, and part of it at least was that they don't eat pigs. Yeah, and it wasn't like, oh, we hate pigs, we would never eat a pig, but it's just that the pigs aren't conducive to their lifestyle and they just didn't bring them in. Whereas when you have these sea people who are Aegeans who are, you know, big pork eaters, and then there are also people who are on board ship. And so if you were going to raise some animals on board ship that were for meat, it would be confined space kind of animals such as mm -hmm. pigs. I found an interesting article. I mentioned it in the side chat, and Finkelstein is one of the co-authors of it. Yeah, I downloaded that already. I'm going to read that because yeah. I'm interested. It, it, it in even has a map this. of you know the frequency of finding pig bones in different areas. Yeah, and uh, what's cool too is, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, the map. Yeah, that's even better. Because I saw, I didn't before I saw the map. I saw he's got a table of the different tells, um, and and the percentage of animal bones that they find in these tells that are pigs. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I'm sure it wasn't an instantaneous point in time where every every. Uh, Highland settlement stopped eating pigs. It was probably like a a gradual thing, obviously. And the book gave no data, but you would have to, by definition of your theory, Shauna, postulate at some time there were no pigs to be eaten because they were brought in by these sea people, right? That could be, yeah. Well, you'd have to show me the, <laughs> um, <laughs> the archaeological data well, for that. I, I, I guess the point is the sea people, though, they never stopped being there, right? Once they, once they came in, yeah, probably they, not. You know, we're, we're thinking that maybe this one tribe, the Denyan, actually became the tribe of Dan and joined up with the Israelites, but at the same time, the Peleset, the Philistines, they never did quite, quite gel. So you know you had you had some some groups that joined up with the Israelites and some groups that maybe didn't, and you know I, I don't know that pork eating would be the reason, but it might be among the things that distinguished the groups as to why they got along, or you know, but if you if you're looking at what what they're saying the reasons for Josiah is Josiah is trying to reach out to all these various groups and to say. You're one of us, so when I come on up there and invade, I want you to join up with me and be part of our confederation of greater Israel and Judah and not one of the people who oppose us. See, so I, I guess I'm saying, you know, maybe so you, you go ahead and you tell the stories of the tribe of Dan, the people who are up there are going to say, yeah, yeah, that's right, Moses, and he was the father of all Israel, and, you know, I know those stories and those customs, and they go along with us. Here's an interesting map. I don't know what time this is, because he, are you guys seeing my screen? No, I can't see. Not yet. Wow, I'm presenting. I don't know why it's not doing that. Okay, let me not present and let me screen. Oh, I mixed it up. I meant to screen share. So here, he's got a table of... He's right here. Are you seeing it yet? Yes. Okay, so oh. on the side here, he's got the different periods of time and then a list of all the of the of the settlements and then the percentage of bones that are pigs. Okay, now he's going through the time and you can see... So these are earlier and then they're li and then become later. And um, this is a map. See, the only thing I wish you put a date on, the, on this, but this is a map of the different settlements with the percentage of pig bones. So like the, this one has a 15% plus of the animal bones are pigs, 
and then these white ones are very low, and then the X's are zero pig bones. So I, I wish he had a map for each uh, time period. Oh, pig frequencies in Iron Age 2B. So that's um, 780 to 680 BC. That's what this map is showing. It would be nice if you had a map for each one. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. I'll stop presenting now. Okay. That overlaps with the Josiah period, doesn't it? The 700s. Right, yep. Am I still presenting? I don't mean to be. No. Really? Because I'm still seeing myself big on the screen. And it does seem like a lot of the, the patriarch stories... Um, especially in the stories of the Old Testament, present the people of Israel and Judah as being shepherds, that it's a very important part of the identity of the people who call themselves Israel and Judah, is that they were the shepherd people. And um, even if you go back in the um, story of Genesis, it, you know the bad guy is the farmer, the guy who slays our yeah. hero shepherd, Abel. Interesting. Was, yeah. The other thing, too, is the Hyksos were described by, well, Josephus mistranslated it as shepherd kings. So, yeah, I guess that wouldn't, I guess that doesn't make sense because he mistranslated it. I guess the better, Hyksos is better translated as foreign kings, but. Anyway, interesting, but yeah, it's a mistranslation, so I guess it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Isn't it true, well, as I recall also, that in the Genesis story of uh, Joshua, where his brothers come in and they won't eat with, they don't, this specifically says they won't eat with shepherds because they actually look down on shepherds, and that's why they were actually, when they came into Egypt, they were sent into a separate, the separate land of Goshen so that they could, it, shepherding was an abomination to the Egyptians. So, in other words, this is how they identified themselves in distinction from the Egyptians as shepherds. And and you notice, yeah, that Josephus says, "Hey, the shepherd kings were our people," means that he himself considered the Israelites to be identified with shepherds. Yeah, that's true, but he's so late that. Yeah. Who knows how far that self-identity goes? That I think he derailed goes. historical research for his, you know, speculations. <laughs> but it is it, the, the stuff with Joshua yeah. is interesting. Or I mean, Joseph. But of course, David was a shepherd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that. Yeah, that. There Abraham seems to be was something. A shepherd. You don't have Abraham bringing in herds of pigs. But Abraham has herds of shepherds, I um, mean herds of sheep and goats. And even the stories of Isaac, he's talking about how he gets the spotted goats to have more offspring than the other goats. But it's still, we're talking about people who are raising sheep and goats. So I do think that that was a big part of who it was that formed the nucleus of, of the people that later became Judah and Israel. Well, yeah, because it's talking about the origin of just about all those people, not just the ones that became Israelite, but they all had pastoral backgrounds one way or the other. What, who, what do you mean all? All the Canaanites? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Well, yeah. Oh. I was just thinking. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, well, it just says all the Highland peoples had that pastoral background, that whole pattern of pastoral, semi pastoral, semi settled, and then back again. And then continue you know, too. So there's a background for all those people was pastoral. Yeah. When you're talking about hill country and um, high country, basically. The only thing you can do with that land is to raise sheep and goats 
or some kind of animals. It's it's very difficult. To, no, because it mentions specifically that they had large amounts of cattle too. the The highlands are not mountains. The highlands are more or less the highlands as opposed to the area where the Canaanites were living. The highlands were continuous with the desert. There was really no elevation differences. By the way, I'm not sure. I just want to make sure I'm keeping up with you guys. Are you suggesting then that the Israelites were a confederation of shepherd nomads? That that's well, what distinguished them from settled peoples in Canaan? And they were is, nomad Canaanites? This is where I'm getting confused because from what I'm reading in here, all the settlements in Canaan whether they're in the highlands or the lowlands, were all eating pigs. Up, but then up to a certain point in time, and it probably wasn't all of a sudden at each of the highlands points. Are you looking at there being the same number of settlements going on all the time? No, yeah. not necessarily, no. But multiple yes. all the time. Because... During the times that um, there are more organized cities, then the people who want to be nomads have have the freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. So it it's kind of it, it's almost it's it seems kind of counterintuitive, but when you have more organized cities and a more organized civilization at this time, you have more nom nomads because they have more opportunity to just live off their animals. They can and just they can get the grain they need from the cities. Right. And and they can right, exactly. They can trade their products around. But when there aren't as many cities, then there's not as much organized trade available for them and they have to then become more self sufficient and that's when they move to the to the combination agriculture and um, nomadic animal herding. And that's when they also need to have more cattle around. When you're nomadic, you can't carry, you, you can't take cattle around. It, it's what right. I was talking about a lot like the, the same thing with the pigs, that they just, they're too big and bulky and eat too much at a time and they require a more settled kind of lifestyle. And they're also more useful for the more settled kind of lifestyle because they were used to pull plows. Yeah. That kind of, you know, if you can become semi-permanent agriculturalists and just take up suddenly the use of cattle in order to do plowing and that kind of stuff, why not pigs? I mean, you know, it's just not really that difficult to start that type of husbandry. Because and then you would, you know, and then you would, you know, drop it later on when you, when conditions have changed and you move to a more nomadic existence out of necessity. Because the pigs aren't as necessary. The um, the cattle have to be used in order to plow the land, but the pigs don't do anything at all like that. They don't produce milk. They don't plow the land. They're they just produce bacon. Yeah, yeah, but there's still food. I mean, you know, are we going to turn down food? But, food but I, I guess... Or garbage disposal if you need it? So why do you think the people, do you think that they just decided that God said they shouldn't eat pigs? And no, I think that they decided that they were, they just decided for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why, but over a process of time to be distinctive from other people's. And that's well, one of the things they chose. That they didn't need the pigs. That they Which don't. is probably why they cho chose not to do it. Well, okay. It wasn't out of necessity that they had well, to stop using it. That's what I'm saying then that the people in the highlands, it didn't really fit with their lifestyle to bring the pigs in and they stopped having the pigs. Meanwhile, when the Philistines came, they liked, they liked pork it, it, with their lifestyle and so they brought them in. And at some point along the way, the people who were the pastoral sheep and goat herders, um, that, that they formed their civilization distinctive from the other people. Yeah, that's the other key thing too. Is they they weren't they didn't. The, I mean, th we're talking about domesticated pigs, not wild boars. So 
Well, you that's a, just go up, huh? That's the thing too that there's very little difference between domesticated pigs and wild boars. Here in Texas, we have millions of dollars of damage done every year by pigs that are basically one or two generations away from the farm that escape and go feral extremely quickly, which is why I'm saying that it, as far as like being able to raise them in a situation where, you, and even cattle, you know, you can, they're, they're slow moving and they're big and they're kind of hard to deal with, but even cattle, you can put them in a herd and they'll come home to the barn and you can kind of deal with them. But pigs will go wild within a generation or less and be completely unmanageable. I've heard about this. Can, can you clear something up for me? Like I've heard that, like let's say you have a, a herd of, is that what you call it, a herd of pigs? Yeah, I guess. They, they, when they run wild, you know, it's not the same as like running a herd of goats or cattle or sheep where you you have sort of a group that are, you know, under the lead of, of a couple of billy goats or, you know, males and, you know, their attendant females. The pigs are, you know, basically wild animals that can be kept in captivity and, and raised as food. Mm -hmm. And people will tell you that they can make pe pets out of pigs, and I, I know that's true. But at the same time, I also know that, you know, people have a very hard time keeping them confined on farms. And when they dig under fences, they become wild very quickly and are, you know, actually dangerous to humans and um, have to be hunted and eradicated in order to keep them from ravaging your land. Yeah. Well, I think we should dub this the great pig problem. <laughs> um, Wayne's reminding me that we're two hours in, so if you guys don't mind, um, do you want to move on to the chapter five, the David Solomon thing? Sure, go ahead. Works for me. Okay. Um, well, what did you guys think about it? Were you convinced? Was there no... What, the, the thing I thought was interesting was they seemed sure that there was a, a King David based off of the uh, Tell Dan Steely um, House of David mention. They just seems like just based off of that, they're sure that there was some historical David, though obviously not the David as described in the, in the Bible. Can I answer on that? Maybe Solomon was historical, too, if I'm reading it right. Did it? I don't remember. Possibly. I, I just don't, I honestly don't remember. But Just like um, remember, remembrances of great dudes. I, mm, yeah. yeah, I don't know that there's any reason to totally discount that there was a David and a Solomon and a Saul. I mean, in terms of, you know, the names of ancient kings that might have had, that might have had kingdoms or what they called kingdoms at the time. Or, or called kingdoms retroactively. <laughs> well, yeah. there are alternate theories, though. Well, I actually I've read um, his latest book um, about the history of the Northern Kingdom of Israel, and Is that um, the Forgotten Kingdom. Yeah, and um, he postulates something that he calls the Solide Kingdom that. Uh, that there does seem to have been a rise in settlements and some sort of organization that occurred around the time that perhaps Saul would have been there and in the cities that are mentioned in the stories about Saul. But of course, you know, there's no real archaeological evidence that the king or kings of whatever that area was had it even, were actually named Saul. I wanted to back up here. Um, yeah, so it seems like Finkelstein and Silverman think there was a David because of the inscriptions that have been found. Um, it's it's very dangerous to place too much weight on like a single piece of evidence, no matter how convincing the evidence is. 
Um, we had that issue during our last reading in, in John Marshall and, you know, the great city in Revelation being where Jesus was crucified. Mm-hmm. Or when the Lord was crucified, and, you know, we, we decided against letting that piece of evidence, you know, dictate how to interpret that passage. But here we got to remember they're actually talking about two different inscriptions. There's the Tell Dan inscription, and there's also another one that mentions David. Oh, that's right. Oh, the yeah, House of right. David in both instances, as Reuben's pointing out. Um, I think there have been actually some um, archaeolog- archaeologists or linguistics or linguists that have um, postulated that that's not exactly the translation they would choose. Yeah, yeah. there's a theory that that's a reference to a god, a Dawood or something. Yeah, like Dawood. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see Reuben's makes a comment that he says, "Why don't we see the House of David like we see the House of Windsor?" Was there a historical Windsor? Well, it's. I don't know. We don't. Happened. We don't have a story about a historical Windsor, whereas we do have a story of a historical David. I could and we also have a mind. steely saying House of David. So that's the difference, I think. I mean, House of Windsor, everyone knows. It's just, it's just a. It's not even ref- meant to be referring to a historical character. Whereas well, how do you know that those inscriptions weren't in the same vein? Well, they could. I'm not saying that they weren't. I'm just saying that <laughs> that we do also have in the Bible a, a, a David, a King David. And yeah, sure, the the story could have been based off of House of David that they just thought, oh, there must have been a King David, so let's invent him because there's some memory of that, you know, from the time of the stel, stel, steely. Um, There's also other contextual stuff too, like you know, as Dr. Price points out, and other scholars have about the relationship between the name of his son Solomon and sun gods. So here we're dealing with possibly two different gods there at the root of these stories. So there's always debatable, I think, whether these are actual historical characters and a process like you just mentioned Doug, could have occurred. But yeah, I do still think that Finkelstein and Silverman give that evidence too much weight. And there, there are other evidence against there being historical Davidic and Solomon kingdoms should, you know, shouldn't be discounted as much as they discount it. Well, what would be the evidence yeah, against what, there being? That's what I'm wondering. Kind of a person named David or Solomon. I mean, aside from you know the the tales of grandeur that are attached to them. I mean, how would you disprove, I mean, I guess, that they actually, what would be the evidence that they never existed? Wayne, that question's for you. Yeah, I'm kind of on the spot. I don't really have a good, good clean answer for that. <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure I was going to say earlier before you asked it the wrong way, so. I'm sorry, David. I mean, Wayne. Um, I guess... What we're really saying, though, is that we we have some kind of legend that there was a pers- there were these people named David and Solomon, and um, you know, for Finkelstein, he he's in a, he's in the position that he would like for people to accept his work, and he would like to maintain his position in the Israeli antiquity, <laughs> and. So why not go ahead and say, you know, yeah, we have evidence that there was a David Solomon because, you know, we do have evidence. There's stories about these guys, and we don't have any kind of a thing that says, proves that they never existed at all. You know, I mean, he he's just he's hedging his bets a bit, you know, to try to stay, to try to keep his books on the, <laughs> you know, to where people will actually read them, but. Um, yeah, there. You know, he he is trying to say that there wasn't really any kind of a grand kingdom, or all these grand palaces and stuff that are claimed in in the Old Testament record. And it goes back to that point I read, of that point of that section I read from there, where I think it was specifically talking about David and stuff like that. How that those individuals. And the, th- the sagas and tales about them were eventually just appropriate for other political means at some time. But they had a historical kernels of 
warlords, chieftains, that kind of stuff. Because there's apparently different Davids in the Bible, if you look at it. You know, you're going to see David the mercenary, David the warlord, David the, the pastoral shepherd. There's actually multiple Davids. Yeah, I'm pretty much agnostic on the whole issue. I, I it wouldn't surprise me if if David and Solomon were totally 100% fictive creations, and it also wouldn't surprise me if there was some guy named David who was, you know, like a chieftain of some really small village or town called Jerusalem. You know. Yeah, I feel I'm over in over well, my head here myself. I got. No opinion here at all. It, 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 it does seem like he possibly wasn't... He doesn't have to have been, I guess, defeated in Jerusalem. That that would definitely be politically expedient for Josiah. That's Yeah, you're right about the Jerusalem part, definitely. But, but um, the Northern... The, the Forgotten Kingdom book... Because they, you know, right about the time what he calls the Solid Kingdom starts to fade, there's a little flurry of activity down, um, kind of next door in what we call Judah, that, um, you know, is centered around some of the cities that are, you know, when you talk about the various stories in the Bible, you know, where you're not necessarily talking about the capital cities, but where there were um, battles. Or where they encountered somebody, some prophet or something, you could kind of get an idea where the um, which part of the country these stories were from, and the David stories then kind of moved next door to the Saul stories. So there's maybe some kind of a possibility that we had a that we had a, a resurgence of some kind of like I said activity. In, in the area known as Judah right about the time that David would have existed. By the way, look up Jebusites on various encyclopedia type sites. You'll find out some interesting things about that group of people. I won't go into it, but I'll just mention that. You know what's interesting on the Tell Dan Steely too is... Uh, am I saying that right, by the way? Yes. Okay. Um, line 8 so line 9 is the one that says the house of David and I made their towns into ruins and turned well line 8 is the king of Israel and I killed and then there's they can't tell blank Yahu son of the king of the house of David now we're on the line 9 I wonder if it's like because wh whose name ended with Yahoo again? Um, that was pretty Yahoo. common, but yeah. Yahoo yeah. is the form of the divine name, so you'll find that in almost everybody's name. <laughs> oh, okay. Including possible rulers that were not even mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> you know, it could have been any. Okay, that makes more sense then. Okay, so yeah, you could, there's no way to pin it down at all if that's the case. Shauna, what were you suggesting about David and Jerusalem? Were you saying that there's no connection between the two, or I missed? I sorry, I missed that. Well, there's not necessarily connection between the two. That um, it was during the time of Josiah that the primacy of Jerusalem was being was being stressed. And so it would be it would be advantageous to Josiah to say that Jerusalem was this big capital city at the time of David, when archaeology says that it probably wasn't. And so it may be that, that David really that his capital city city never was Jerusalem. But I guess I'm not going to say that I really have a dog in that hunt. How important do you think the Josiah is to the history of Israel. Do you think that he created the whole back history? Uh, do you think that he was responsible for uh, Israel forming as a nation? I mean, is he the reason why they separated from the Canaanites? Or the Canaanite, that group of Canaanites decided to form something separate from the others? 
No, no, no. Um, at, at, there was plainly a kingdom of Israel. The archaeology supports it. And um, pretty much just as everything, from the time you get to King Omri onward, pretty much everything that the books of Kings says is basically true, at least his term, in terms of Israel. But um, when Assyria conquered Israel and created the collapse there, a lot of Israelites moved down to Judah. And it was at that time that um, the civilization began to crystallize there and that, and that things really began to happen in Jerusalem. And um, when you get to the time of Josiah, the empire of Assyria was beginning to collapse. It wasn't completely co it wasn't completely taken over by Babylon, but they had started to have to abandon some of their outer regions in order to in in order to take care of the various rebellions and um, the threat that was coming from from Babylon. And it was during this period that Josiah arose and thought that he could go forth and bring the northern kingdom of Israel into the fold of Judah and make one unified kingdom. And so it was politically expedient to get the various stories from all the groups of people in the north and in the south that were still there that that they could be forged into a single nation. And um, when you look at what happened to Josiah, actually he, he did spend some time in the north actually like destroying um, uh, centers of quote idolatry and in, con and in conquering areas of the north, but he was pretty prematurely cut short by the Egyptians. So, you know, all, all of his hopes and dreams did not come to fruition. He was circumcised. <laughs> who, who, who was? Josiah. Yeah. And he also was a, a, big, a big part of his reforms were really cracking down on idolatry, right? Foreign god worship. Um, yeah, because you could see that as um, as moving toward establishing the primacy of the cult in Jerusalem. Yeah. Get all of these other cults, you can get sort of like what they did with Christianity in Rome, right? If you can get rid of all these other groups and bring them into the fold, then you can have a unified nation that can then go forth and and um, stand against all the others around them. Mm -hmm. Just going with that picture that you described, I'm trying to think why, if there were a group of Canaanites that decided to unite to to worship Jehovah alone, why is it that they would form two separate kingdoms? And you're talking about Josiah then you in attempting to unite the two I'm thinking there was Josiah, a thing. Josiah was not was not even born when Israel pretty much I think when Israel was was um, conquered by the Assyrians that there was there was most definitely an Israel now what what the book is trying to say and what I, I think I go along with is that there was never a united kingdom in the time of David and Solomon. That if there was a David and Solomon they had a small little kingdom that existed down in Ju what we call Judah. And that there was another kingdom that was in Israel. It seems interesting to me though when you read about in the Bible that you know supposedly that Israel broke off from Judah because they were unhappy at having to, you know, do all these building products, um, these these building projects for Solomon, and mm -hmm. his um, 
his his hair, his heir, uh, Rehoboam or Jeroboam. So they broke off and they formed Israel. And then immediately they go about it. They do a bunch of building projects of their own. So, you know, really, who is, who really did start the building projects? Wasn't it really the Israelites, according to the archaeology? They're the first ones who have it. That they had the build the big building projects and the big civiliza civilization, and that later on, Judah co-ops it as being part of their history. I guess I'm trying to think. I'm just trying to figure out why, in my mind, why it is that if these people are forming into a nation to worship one God, why didn't they form one nation? Why did it happen to? First, form into two separate nations. Well, I, can see why, I can see why, as the Bible describes it, to form one nation that eventually divides. I guess I'm having a hard time thinking that well, it would there, be there was into two. one nation formed in order to worship one God. There was the territory that King Omri and his heirs were able to control at various times through the strength of their armies. And there was, you know, there, there seems to have been quite a bit of idolatry and worshipping of various gods that took place during, throughout the land of Israel and Judah. And there were a lot of um, so, uh, of cultic sites that that existed in the kingdom of Israel that were later attacked by Josiah. We're talking about different periods in history, so that the kingdom of Israel existed during a time when before they were conquered by Assyria, and then after they were conquered by Assyria, the people from Judah from Israel moved down to Judah. And the king and kingdom of Judah actually became something. And then the king of Judah, Josiah, thought, hey, why not grab that kingdom of Israel, those lands north of me? Because the kingdom because the empire of Assyria has withdrawn and the time is right, and we can make one united kingdom out of both uh, out of both of these these groups that have existed in the past. Yeah, that's how I always thought of, a similar way I thought of the evolution, like you had a people that were ethnically distinguishing themselves, but that the, the monotheism and idolatry, the ending of that was, came on later, after an ethnic identity had become to, to be formed. And I think Sean is also saying something like the Bible was written in a way t so that the people of Judah could lay claim to that. Yeah, it was all one kingdom at one time. So by right, we can unite it, you know, be yeah, based and, on this. Right, and that's that's a big part of this chapter at the end is they're arguing that, that the stories of David and um, Solomon are, they're saying that they're like, Propaganda, this grand kingdom, and these two, you know, huge, you know, David, a successful warrior king, um, and then Solomon, you know, this grand kingdom, very successful. Um, hey guys, so Josiah is saying, hey guys, look at this, look at our our ancestor kings uh, and our how great our kingdom was. Uh, we can do it again, you know. And going off what Sean was saying, the historical setting. Here's the northern. Here's uh, Israel that had just been conquered, and then the Assyrians left, and it's just there for the taking. And this story would have been kind of propaganda to kind of work up a a national um, fervor, if you will, to to be expansionist. And this story serves that purpose perfectly as propaganda. And you could say that probably a lot of people. From Israel, refugees south, right quick, take a mm -hmm. line from gone with the gone with the wind, and so when they moved down to Judah, they had a they had a desire to restore the kingdom that they had lost to the Assyrians, and so as they moved down to Judah, they they you know 
being um, a more sophisticated group, were able to influence thought and perhaps even the, the monarchy quite a bit so that they could try to think about in terms of getting back the land of Israel that they had lost. Good point. Uh, that's yeah, I think a lot of scholars would agree with that. So was it one or the other, or could it have been a factor of both, or mainly the latter, that what you're saying, that, that it was more of an influence of the, of the northern people um, trying to, to basically get back to their homeland through the help of the Judites? Well, I think that's what um, the book is trying to say, that when all of a sudden, when, Assyri when the kingdom of Israel collapses in the face of Assyrian invasion, the, Judah, the kingdom of Judah rises. And it's because of the influence of the people who have gone down there and brought their literature, their stories, their um, administrative capabilities. Not only that, there's also a vacuum left by a very powerful kingdom that's no longer there. When you're talking about Josiah, that's what's happening, is that they've, they've got their opportunity. The people who went south and perhaps their, you know, their children or grandchildren see that this is the big opportunity. Assyria is collapsing and we can move north now and we can take back this land that we lost. See, I thought they were saying, I need to go back and read it, but I thought they were saying that that because of, that this land is now newly available, if you will, for the taking, that Josiah had, you know, had this agenda. He wanted to be an, ex he wanted to expand his kingdom. And this was, the, the King David, King Solomon stories were kind of propaganda to, to work up the national will, if you will, to go conquer these lands and maybe other lands too. And it was, it was his expansionary agenda that was the real driving force behind... These are not contradictory ideas. That, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm wondering what you guys think was a bigger influence. Was it, was it Josiah's expansionary um, desires? more than, say, the people who used to live in the north wanting, to, you know, bringing well, their stories down and influencing and wanting to get back home? Like, in, in other words, was it that Israel was, northern people were kind of using Josiah as a tool to get them back home, or was it a little bit of both? Where do you guys see the, the balance of these two? I agree factors? with Shauna's viewpoint. It's a mixture of things. Like yeah, sure. Why, why did Josiah want that? No, he, I, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just saying, do... I'm, you know, he's got some some northerners who can, you know, who, who are behind him. He's going to naturally seek out those people for support. And if they have some great stories that they could work into a really nice, um, you know, into, into a really nice package to get people on board, so much the better. And it doesn't mean that those stories were made up out of whole cloth. That, you know, it's so much the better if you could say that, you know what you heard about David? Well, guess what? You know, it's better than you ever thought. And, you know, so that, it, you know, if, you, if you've got some kind of a kernel of truth there, then you can just blow it up into whatever you want. Didn't you also say basically a lot of that um, glory of Solomon, the Golden Age, was just a reflection that the northern people remembered from when they had a very viable and possibly powerful northern kingdom that did exist? Was that directed at someone? Yeah, at Shauna. Oh, yeah, I agree. I, I think that... Yeah, oh, oh, shit. I just spilled some wine on my plate. Oh. Okay. Party foul. Fortunately, it went onto a plate and not on anything else. <laughs> on that note. Hallelujah. My life is an Eric Burden song. Um... 
there was one table to oh what do you guys think about the gates the gate at Gezer Megiddo and um, uh, Hotsor that had like a similar six room construction I thought they they totally demolished that argument very well the fact that you know they found these gates and the argument was that well oh since these since these three cities that the Bible says Solomon had construction projects at, and these the, that these these gates all have a very similar design. Therefore, that proves that there was a, Somal, a Solomonic kingdom. Yadin. Yeah, yeah. That I think archaeologists and archaeologists Syria and elsewhere. Yeah, it's very much they're very much a product of their times, don't you think? It's like you know, look at Yadin. How he was a hero of what the uh, War of Independence from like the 40s and that, and then he was a major general and archaeologist by, by, by that period. So, you know, there's a lot of nationalist fervor in how they view things. So, you know, if you want to see a Solomon, evidence for Solomon, then you're, you're going to see it. You'll find it, yeah. And the stables thing I thought was interesting, too, finding the, these, these they had a nice diagram. I'll just throw it up there. These um, pillared, Buildings that look like stables, and oh, that was Sol Solomon's stables to house his uh, his uh, war horses or whatever, you know. And these are the gates, by the way. Well, um, you know, we we still see that kind of stuff now, right? I I remember there was some kind of a boat, a fishing boat that was that was uncovered around the the Sea of Galilee, and it just seemed like it could hold a dozen people. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Jesus's boat, you know, where they took the twelve. Peter took the twelve disciples out into the Sea of Galilee. I mean, you know. There was a great yeah, a line. I think, there was a great line. I think it was in a Christopher Hitchens book, but he it, it it was it was a perfect summary of this style of pressing archaeological evidence into service for a particular view of history, if you will, and it, it was a great summary of like the absurdity of that practice, and it was, uh, I forget the exact context and the formulation of the sentence, but basically like, you know, if you add together all the supposed, you know, splinters or pieces of the cross that Jesus was hung on, the cross would have been like 10,000 feet tall, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier in the book, uh, Bible on Earth, didn't they basically talk about the Albrightian school of archaeology, where it's basically you're you're approaching archaeology with a spade in one hand and the Bible in the other? Exactly. Yeah, they said that 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 for that for him, everything was every archaeological find had to fit somewhere into biblical history. So if they came across some ruin in some place where the Bible said there was some town or whatever, well, this must be it, you know? And they're saying, well, we're, this, we're not doing that approach anymore. We're, you know, the, ar the archaeological evidence comes first, and if it happens to agree with the Bible, fine. And if it doesn't, we're not going to pretend it, it does. And what, what ruined it was more accurate dating of all that stuff. It could not have been Solomonic because it was, <laughs> it was uh, 900s, you know? Yeah. Although... Uh, they didn't mention it, and I was surprised. Those carbon datings that they made were in towns that had been burned. And when you are trying to carbon date something that was possibly exposed to fire, it can really um, throw off the dating because you're getting a ratio of, of, of different isotopes other than carbon-14 to carbon fourteen, they're in they're, they'll be in a, in a thrown off proportion if it was just natural aging because the the fire introduces carbon extra carbon. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but that occurred to me able, too. But they're also able to go in layers, right? And then they would be able to get an accurate dating of the previous layer and the successive layer in a lot of cases. That's if, right. Yeah. If you remember what the book said is that they said they dated stuff from those palace ruins that were beneath the collapsed structures that were destroyed by fire. So what they were saying is that we could date those 
underlying palaces much later than it could possibly be. That that makes the upper layers that were destroyed by fire a lot earlier still. A lot later still. Yeah, a lot later still. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to say that that, that, they're, that the dating was wrong. That that's a, what Sean has said. They can go to the different layers where there wasn't fire. You know, it already been underground at that at the time the fire happened at this layer, and say, okay, well, already it's too it's too late. I've got a book that too goes early. into the um, carbon dating, and it just tries to demolish all the scientific carbon dating, you know, in the service of proving the Bible. It's just a, a remarkable read. I'd have to let you guys take a look. A, at a that. remarkable exercise in rationalization. Yeah. Yeah, I do think that the the better date, the better methods of dating, is what really took these guys out. But you'll be surprised at how often. You know, you'll find Christian apologetics, you know, going back and, and bringing up this, you know, those same Solomon stables and um, the six chambered gates as though they haven't already been debunked. Yeah. And the same with carbon dating. They'll just say, okay, Doesn't work. Finkelstein will say, yeah, we've got these new techniques and we were able to do this. And they'll just ignore that like it never even happened and go back to, oh, you know, they're using these techniques and they're faulty. Maybe, you know, it's always stuff from like 50, 50 years ago or more where they're still hanging on to those, those types of ideas, thinking that you're not, you're not up on anything. Or maybe they're not up on it. <laughs> well, it you have to understand that for archaeologists of the ancient Levant, and if, and if you can just hear that phrase, archaeology of the ancient Levant, that's what we're really talking about and how boring that sounds versus survival archaeology. And so, you know, once they get to the point where They've pretty much proven that the Bible and the old stories aren't true, and especially if the Christ myth story ever becomes the predominant theory, man, all the all the funding for archaeology is just gonna in in textual studies and everything it's just gonna dry up. Yep, pretty much. It's also to, to contrast between the archaeology that takes all the Levant into consideration rather than just a narrow focus on biblical lands. You know, there there's archaeology that looks at Syrian archaeology, all that stuff, you know, Jordanian, everything. So it's a much broader category and, and geographical area now, whereas in the past they want to focus on a narrow area without the, the wider context. And the more wider context you bring into it, the less viable some of the earlier theories have become. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all those Christian fundies, man, that they're just they're not even gonna think about trying to fund an archaeologist, even with ideas as modest as Israel Finkelstein's. No way, yeah. Um, there was one other Thing, just for the benefit of uh, Dale, you said you didn't have a chance to read the chapter, although you probably heard a lot of this stuff before anyway. But and then for viewers that may maybe aren't going to read the book or haven't seen it, all five of them, um, there was one table that really summed up a lot of the the chapter really well. Well, I'll just read it because it's the text is too small. But they had it yeah. displayed when I first came on. Oh yeah, what page is this on? 131. Um, basically, it's giving, um, well, it's three, it's, it's listing in columns, king, dates, biblical testimony, archaeological findings, and then the three kings in rows, Saul, um, 1025 to 105 B.C., David 105 to 970 BC, and then Solomon 970 to 931 BC. So for Saul, the biblical testimony, I'm just reading this because it sums up a lot really well, um, a big part of the chapter. Um, Saul, first king appointed by the prophet Samuel, that's a biblical testimony, archaeological finds in the highlands continuation of iron 
age one settlement system. So again, that's what that's what they're finding. They're just finding, you know, lots of these uh, settlements that are going through different phases of uh, pastoralism versus settled art, uh, agriculture. Um, King David, biblical testimony, conquers Jerusalem and makes it his capital, establishes a vast empire covering most territories of the land of Israel. Archaeological find, finds no evidence for David's conquests or for his empire. In the valleys, Canaanite culture continues uninterrupted. In the highlands, continuation again of Iron Age one settlement system. Um, King Solomon, biblical testimony, builds the temple and place and the palace in Jerusalem. Also active at Megiddo, Hazor, and and Gezer. Archaeological finds no sign of monumental architecture. And that was one of the things they said. There's not even a trace of Solomon's temple. Or, or the palace, or not a shred of it, where there, as Dr. Price always says, where there would have to be something. I mean, something that massive, a temple, palace complex. I mean, it's just inconceivable that there would be no shred of evidence of, of, of something that monumental. I um, wrote those alternative sort of crazy websites years ago where this guy was proposing that the reason why they're not finding the Temple of Solomon is because they're not looking in the right place. That the place where they built the second temple was not the right spot. Yeah, and I heard that. That um, they need to be looking at a place on the springs of Gihon. I read a book once about that, yeah. Well, they're, they mentioned that in here, saying that they're looking right at that spot that's right next to the Spring of Gihon. It says, um, uh, right here, I've, um, the, uh, to the south of the Temple Mount, outside the walls of the Ottoman city, so that's Old Jerusalem with the Ottoman walls around it, stretches the long, narrow, relatively low ridge of the city of David, the old mound of bronze and early Iron Age Jerusalem. Um, it is separated from the surrounding hills by two ravines. The eastern one, the Kidron Valley, separates it from the village of Sh uh, Siloam. The main water source of biblical Jerusalem, the spring of Gihon, is located in this ravine. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Um, if you look at some of the, the sources in the old stories, they talk about the spring of Gihon being related to the place where Solomon's temple was rather than necessarily what we now call the Temple Mount, which, you know, say, well, maybe when those people came back from Babylon, they didn't get the spot quite right. And um, also, I don't know, how much, how much trace was the Temple of Solomon going to leave? You know, it made out of wood, right? The book I had right, was citing uh, Ezekiel, I think, who was indicating that the river, the river flowed out of the temple, and of course it doesn't from the current temple mount. So, have, has anyone looked at that alternative location? I think there's supposed to be like, <laughs> like a judge car lot there or something in the spot where the guy, you know, the guy whose website I read said that like a judge car lot there or something. <laughs> well, even I mean, even in these other settlements that we've been reading about, like at Gazer and uh, Megiddo, I mean, and even some of these rural settlements, they're they're talking about finding ancient wood beams used in the construction, like parts of the gate, of these gates, wood, wood parts of the gate. So if you had a whole huge palace and temple, was the temple made out of wood? Part of it was. I thought it was mostly made of stone. Yeah. But they were talking about importing cedars from Lebanon because Solomon was good friends with the king of yeah. Tyre. Right. But, you know, that can't be the only material. Yeah, stone, wood, metal. By the way, Dan, there's, there's nothing. I mean, we found absolutely nothing. So, yeah, unless, like Shauna says, that it's actually really under that car lot or whatever. 
Well, uh, there's one there now, but just think, you know, there was the Crusades. The first thing they did, and I think it mentions this too, is they started digging in the Temple Mount. And I'm sure they dug other places too because they had no restrictions. They could have did what they want. Right. Later on, in um, when it was a British protectorate, you know, they were free to dig in places that they aren't free to dig in now. Nobody, I think, and it's hard to believe that they didn't dig around that area pretty extensively wherever they could. There are, there is a section, the traditional city of David. There's a little section south of the Temple Mount, the current Temple Mount, which, which is, uh, there have been digs done there, and there is a, they actually give tours of the excavation area, I believe. They have it set aside you know, big science saying that the city of David, and so work has been done there. But they, I don't think they certainly have never found any indications of a temple on that side as well. Well, not much rests on this anyway because of the other evidence that that we we're talking about, and it's in here. Like, um, there's no signs of um, scribal activity. Um, no signs of like trade seals or trade stamps or there's just no trace anywhere at that time of of a developed kingdom where you'd have to have this sorts of stuff these sorts of things you'd need administration you'd need trade you'd need um, all kinds of political structures in place and like I mean there's just nothing like that at all so it, was, it wouldn't just be that okay, well, we didn't find the palace, but it, there's so much else missing um, that would have to be there and if, if, and if, if this empire kingdom was really there as described. Yeah, maybe there was some like tiny little wood fort or something that um, that was there. Possibly, that, possibly that's true. But the, the point is that there was no... Solomonic or Davidic kingdom as described in the Bible. That's there's no evidence for that. Even if there was some, you know, little fort or palace, or if you want to call it that, somewhere, some other place other than the Temple Mount. When you say as described, are you you're not? Again, similar to what we were talking about with the Exodus. I mean, was there a kingdom? If we're discussing whether there was a kingdom in the south before Josiah, we're not really. It doesn't have to have been to the extent that the Bible describes it all the way to the Euphrates River down to Egypt. You know, similar to, I mean, that's similar to what, what we were discussing where people would discount the Hyksos theory just because of all these other trappings. I, I expect that they're going to exaggerate on all these details, but are you saying, though, that there, there's no indication of any kingdom in Judah before the time of Josiah? There, yeah, there's no indication of any any kind of organized rulership system in place. There's there are no um, uh, what are those like trade seals, trade stamps for trading goods and stuff like that. Um, there aren't there aren't uh, admin political administration buildings. There, there's like nothing of of the stuff that that would have to be there if there was a a kingdom in place. Yeah, maybe it wasn't as big as they're saying, but even if it was smaller, you'd have some of this stuff. And it's, it's not the time of Josiah exactly. It's the time before Josiah yeah. that, that, that the Assyrians um, crushed the kingdom of Israel and then the pe some of the people of Israel refugeed south and brought the trappings of civilization down to Judah. So there's a time lapse there before the time of Josiah where there's a there's you know things have been organizing for a while and then there's an opportune moment when Assyria is starting to weep and they're not paying as much attention to those area to the northern uh, the northern territory as they had in the past and so then there's an opportunity to move forward militarily and take over those lands. Are you talking about Hezekiah in particular? Um. Uh, maybe I, I haven't I haven't like looked at the history recently enough to know exactly Hezekiah, but Josiah. The let's say the collapse of Israel and the rise of Josiah were not. 
were not simultaneous kind of kind of actions. I bring up Hezekiah because according to the Bible, he was the king when the Assyrians came and destroyed the northern kingdom. He was the king in Judah, and the Assyri and according to the description in the Bible, the, the Assyrians attempted they surrounded Jerusalem, and then God, you know, wiped them all out after Hezekiah prays. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, you mean you can you can take that you can take that story for what it's worth. Although I have heard that um, that the that the Egyptians may very well have sent someone north to um, sort of check the Assyrian invasion invasion at that point. And nobody is saying that there wasn't an, a Jerusalem at all. Yeah. But, that it wasn't the center of a great empire as described by um, the Old Testament. They're, they describe the, the Jerusalem from that time period that we're talking about, the supposed time of David and Solomon, as a typical hill country village. I guess I was also remembering something that John suggested last time where he mentioned that he noticed some copy, copying going on in the king list between the kings of Judah, copying the king list of Israel, as if, as if the southern kingdom of Judah hadn't really existed very long, not nearly as long as the kingdom, the northern kingdom had, and that it had to invent its history, kind of patterned after the northern kingdom, especially when, as you, Sean, have suggested, talked about, people from the northern kingdom fleeing down south after the Assyrians had come and destroyed their land. Well, it, it, is, history, you know. it is pretty interesting that a lot of the kings of the south uh, of Judas, uh, you know, seem to have names that rhymed <laughs> with the kings that were in the northern kingdom. Um, it doesn't. I don't know that it necessarily means that there wasn't anything happening there at all. I think more like the kings that came that that arose after um, the Judahites went went south sort of invented their history to try to link themselves back to to David and, and sort of filled in the blanks. Sort of like you know, like in the Nor in the New Testament or, or in Christian times, when you know there's there's all the, these people who are who are filled seem to be sort of filled in to be the names of popes, but there's really nothing there that that indicates that such a person ever existed, and it's sort of like they just sort of filled in the gaps there. And I think they do the same thing with kings lists. You know what I mean? That I I don't think it means that there was nothing there, but that they wanted to. To connect themselves back to a person named David, and sort of they so they filled in the names of of, of kings in order to make it seem continuous. Yeah, and the Egyptians did the same thing. I think it was a common um, monarchical practice. It wasn't just the kings too. But it's like the story that you were alluding to earlier about the uh, attack on on Judah. It's you know they had they were aware that there was a kingdom of Judah that arose after Israel, they had to explain how they could have survived with such a powerful enemy as Assyria. Well, you know, they said divine intervention preserved us, but really what was going on is that they probably had treaty or vassal type relationship with Assyria, so they only existed by, by the good graces of Assyria as probably some kind of buffer territory between them and Egypt, you know. Um... There was one other thing I wanted to read because, you know, one of the, the, the um, themes running through each chapter of this book is the historical setting, even of these stories from different time periods, going from the patriarchs up to now, the, the time of David and Solomon. Um, you know, David, who's supposedly around 1000 BC, Solomon a little after that, um, they're arguing that they're... That through all these stories that take place through these different times, were actually, if you look closely at the historical setting being described, it's seventh century. It's the, the the time of King Josiah, and you know we already talked about it in the last hangout about the first two things that the patriarchal age and then the Exodus, and then we talked about it in the uh, Canaan 
and who are the Israelites? That, that, they didn't really talk about that because that was just a question of who are the Israelites. But in this one, again, on page 143, I just wanted to read a, a quick section about this. Um, of course, by the 7th century BCE, conditions in Judah had changed almost beyond reckoning. Jerusalem was now a relatively large city dominated by a temple to the God of Israel that served as the single national shrine. The institutions of monarchy, a professional army, and administration had reached a level of sophistication that met and even exceeded the complexity of the royal institutions of the neighboring states. And once again, we can see the landscapes and costumes of 7th century Judah as the setting for an unforgettable biblical tale, this time of a mythical golden age. The lavish visit of Solomon's trading partner, the Queen of Sheba, to Jerusalem, and the trade in rare commodities with distant markets such as the land of Ophir in the south, no doubt reflect the participation of 7th century Judah in the lucrative Arabian trade. The same holds true for the description of the building of Tamar in the wilderness and the trade expeditions to faraway lands setting out from Ezion Geber in the Gulf of Aqaba, um, two sites that have been securely identified and that were not inhabited before late monarchic times, and David's royal guard, the, help me out on this pronunciation, guys, um, Keratites or Cherethites and Pelethites, or Pelethites, however you say that, long assumed by scholars to have been Aegean in origin, should be understood on the background of the service of Greek mercenaries, the most advanced fighting force of the day in the um, in the Egyptian and possibly Judite armies of the 7th century. So again, 7th century historical setting, even when you're even in the stories of David and Solomon. I'm willing to go with them on that, but I would I personally think that these are romances and sagas of the post-exilic period. Yeah, I, I personally need to read more about the, the real super minimalist guys because I don't know enough about that. But yeah, they're arguing through the whole book. That's the only reason I wanted to read it. They're arguing that all of these stories from Genesis to the stories about David and Solomon, that all, if you look closely at the historical details in these writings, they all seem to be describing the, the 7th century. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we covered the Gates thing, carbon dating. Um, we covered... Oh, the other problem was, you know, we talked about... Um, well, here's one another interesting little passage I wanted to read, talking about the, ex the lack of... Uh, well, but it's actually, I'm not going to read, it's the same stuff, you know. No archaeological indication of the wealth, manpower, and level of organization that would be required to support large armies, blah, 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 blah. And then it talks a little bit, too, about um, the supposed uh, extensive conquest of David, no evidence for that. Um, can we talk about the size of Jerusalem? There's one point that made me laugh is when it was talking about uh, Yadin finding all these Solomonic constructions, gates, so yeah. with, in Megiddo, Hazor, places like that. Well, what's Jerusalem like at that time? Eh, it's, it's a shack. <laughs> you know, it's like Solomon was ruling from, you know, a village like you mentioned earlier. But that, when it was going through that, that kind of cracked me up. Yeah, and I mean, if that's that's exactly right. Like, we have these remains of city gates supposedly built under the reign of the rule of Solomon, but we don't have Jack all in Jerusalem, the capital, you know, other than, a, 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 to quote them, a small country village or whatever, however they phrased it. So, yeah, big, however you look at it, even if there was some historical kernel of truth to all this stuff, which is possible. Um, there's just no way that the stories as described are uh, supported by archaeology. 
you know, it all reminds me of Henry the Seventh, actually. Um, you know, at the end of the War of the Roses, Henry the Seventh took over, and he wanted to establish himself as being, you know, the true heir to the throne to put an end to all the conflict. And he made a really big deal out of Arthur and the stories of Camelot. And somehow or another, they actually managed to dig up the skeleton of Arthur and Glastonbury. And they, quote, quote, discovered the round table, you know, and hung it up on a wall somewhere. You know, and of course, we can all look back and say there never really was a Camelot or there never really was a King Arthur, at least not as we um, understand from the old romances. But Henry the Seventh actually resurrected all these things for his people in order to serve his propaganda purposes, much as you could see Josiah resurrecting all this stuff about David in order to serve his purposes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And in the same way that they found the round table, Josiah found the book of the law of Moses, you know, same type of thing. This probably happened all the time, you know, in, in uh, su succession changes or any, whatever the, the, whatever the um, occasion would be that warrant doing something like this. Probably this practice probably has a very ancient pedigree. Like even before Josiah's day. The Egyptians did it big time. All the time they were rewriting their history. Yeah, you know, you all look at all those statues that we find with the noses cut off or, or you know, like various, various iconographies. It was just wiped away and covered up with something else. Yeah, but, or statues being renamed that were clearly of one pharaoh, but they scratched it out and renamed, put someone else's name on it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, what, any closing thoughts so far on those three chapters, or did anyone have anything else to say about the David Solomonic period? Um, what do you guys think of the book so far? I'm enjoying the book. Uh, I feel a little over my head on judging the information in it, though, as far as kind of just sitting back and listening to a lot of the discussion here today. But yeah. I'm enjoying the book, but yeah, I don't, I don't have any competence at judging what it's saying at all. Well, you can tell we're enjoying it because we're really discussing the heck out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to say again, thank all you guys for for coming to these hangouts and you know um, taking the time to 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 discuss all this stuff in the book and you know thanks Shauna especially for coming in. I know you. You know, you're probably busy and can't come to all these, but we really appreciate having you because obviously you're so knowledgeable about this topic. So, and John and all you guys, like, it's great being able to discuss all this stuff with you guys. So, thank you. Yeah, still a lot more stuff. The next time I'm reading back to the Old Testament again, I'll give me more to think about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I I just finished reading the or listening to the audio book of the of the Torah and I just started on the book of Joshua so now that I've read through this I, I'm going to go back and go over those two books again because I haven't read them for like probably 10 years or more ago and I've not even carefully so yeah it's going to it's going to be interesting to read those again in light of this stuff so yeah so anyway any any closing thoughts on that chapter or that section of reading or the book as as a whole from anyone uh, actually, the super minimalists, the nihilists, or whatever you would call them, um, want to go ahead and say that the stories of David come as late as the Herodian period, or, or not Herodian, but the Hasmonean period, and that wow. they are, are very Hellenistic. And if you do read them, they do read very much like the stories of Greek heroes, the stories of David. Um, but I went through a little bit of, re I, I did a little quick Google search and I found that the Iliad is from the same century as what um, Finkelstein is postulating the stories of David came from with Josiah. So it's 
um, the Hellenistic elements, I guess, are not necessarily from a later period, but could very well have come from the seventh century, as as um, Finkelstein says. Yeah, Reuben saying Solomon equals Alexander. <laughs> I think they had mentioned the Iliad and Odyssey somewhere in here. In that yeah, kind of they, a, they made some allusions to it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is this is the thing. Of maybe I'm wanting to argue against a little bit. That, Go for it. That that Alexander, I mean Alexander is as late as the fourth century. You know, so even though the Alexander romances are very well overblown and stuff, it doesn't seem to me like the stories of Solomon are necessarily that new. That they could very well have still come from um, the seventh century because they aren't really that elaborate. I mean, you, you know, they're. The, you get the Alexander romances. You've got stories of Alexander swimming under the ocean and holding his breath for hours and stuff like that. And um, you know, in the stories of Solomon, you just got a guy who's got a thousand wives versus <laughs> guys with Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh who only had a couple of hundred wives. <laughs> and and so I guess I'm saying that I don't. While I'm not discounting that they could be from a later period, I'm not going to say that they necessarily have to be. Right, because I think the one of the big characteristics of the sagas of Samuel and Kings is the anti-monarchical flavor to it. And you would see that as being not very welcome in the time of the Hasmoneans. That's why I put it as like Persian period, because the Persians would have every reason for propaganda being written to be anti-monarchical, monarchical. So, um, actually, I have a. I, I think I can find a link to a, a book that's free online that you know goes for the whole, like most extreme version on the other side that the whole thing was made up by the Persians and maybe next time we can read that and see what we think about it. Yeah, if you can find it, put post it on the uh, Facebook thing and um, yeah, we could we could definitely do that. I think, um, the, I think I gave Doug that link Friday. Did you? Yeah. What was the book called? I think the one that I've got is called How the Persians Created Judaism or <laughs> something like yeah. that. Uh oh, was yeah, the book called the um was the book called um um oh shit. Remember I was talking about that guy that he had that theory of the dinosaurs? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's from that website. Yeah, I did. Wasn't crazy. The, the stuff I wasn't read, read wasn't as crazy at all as all that. But I haven't read it in a few years, so I'd like to read it again, just like this, because I've done a lot more history research and stuff. Um, actually, because of the the biblical minimalism stuff that I read, you know, I started wanting to check out. Well, you know, just how plausible is this stuff? You know. Yeah. Yeah, the, he only out. put that as a PDF, though. Um, he only did books on Christianity, actually printed, but everything was either on the website or in PDF. For this Hangout, though, I'd like to try to stick to books from people who have respectable scholarly credentials, to put it lightly. Well, this the, the guy we're talking about that has these crazy dinosaur theories. Uh, he, he, I don't think he has a book out, right? He just had some some blog posts about about he it. did he did write that dinosaur book I think that's available in print yeah but I mean we're not reading that <laughs> no. I'm thinking about something that's got dinosaur theories or anything but well it's the same guy Philip R Davies is it no it's no no Dr. M G McGee I think his name is oh McGee yeah that is the guy. Yeah, he's got both the Essene theory that Jesus was in a scene. He wrote basically two books on that, and then he wrote a thing about uh, dinosaur extinction. But everything he wrote on biblical minimalism was only in PDF format available or his website, which actually has more material than this PDF. Well, his PDF is pretty interesting, actually. 
Um, I, I don't know. The, the idea that Jesus was an Essene, a lot of people seem to buy that, and it isn't something that I necessarily ascribe to. It, of course, I'm not even... I'm kind of more on the Jesus myth theory anyway, but even so, I, the Essenes weren't really the people. When you read their, their literature and read about them, they weren't really the people that all these pre-Christian, that all these Christians think they were. Um, the Was that the book you were talking about by this guy? that you wanted to possibly read, or were you talking about uh, Philip yeah, Davies? Yeah, I guess it's that same guy. I think McGee is his name, but oh, okay. there wasn't anything in it about... <laughs> and I have to say, I, I, you know, I, didn't, really, I didn't have any really um, preconceived notions when I read his book. It was just something I came across on the internet, and then since then I've, I've read some stuff that's more scholarly on... on I guess that period of history. It'd be interesting yeah. to see this stuff again and go over it, and, but I'm <laughs> certainly not forcing it on everyone. Well, he did influence a lot of my thinking, you know, so I do spout some things that I learned from his website in the course of the Hangouts, but like every other scholar, I don't agree with 100% of anybody. Um, okay, so... Uh, any oh, I think we. I think somebody's given us the link here. Yeah, over Dale on the side. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How Persia created Judaism. That, that's the, that's the one. A lot of its um, stuff on this website is um, like uh, repetitive. You get the. You know, after a while, you're getting the same chapters over and over under different names. And um, then there's a whole introduction where he rails against how uh, against all the scholars that don't agree with him. <laughs> yeah, and but, unfortunately, he doesn't give enough um, bibliographical information. He just kind of like just throws it out there, and you can't tell what ideas are his and what are other people's, or what ideas actually have evidence for him. <laughs> well, you'd like to look it up, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, actually, I spent a few. I spent some time looking a lot of this stuff up and reading some other books. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting when you start reading stuff about, um, I don't know, Ezra and Nehemiah and the history of of the people who came back, um, it, it, the people who came back from the Babylonian exile, and what we really know about that. Because yeah, in the recent um, podcast from Dr. Price, Dr. Price goes into the one of the theories that McGee supports is that the uh, returners from exile were not the same people who went into exile. Well, you know, when you look at the list of people that are listed in um, Ezra and Nehemiah, there are definitely some names that are not Jewish people, but are people who came back from Persia with Persian names. I mean, even even your mainstream scholars are going to admit this. Well, that that makes sense anyway. Whatever whatever framework you're looking at. All well, you can in, explain right? this in a couple of ways. One is that a lot of Jewish women were given, you know, the best looking Jewish girls were probably given to Babylonian um, nobles as their concubines or second wives or whatever and they had children and so maybe even though they had Babylonian or Persian names it doesn't mean that they weren't of Jewish extract but just that they had these names and that they were amongst the colonists that were sent back and actually the the whole theory is pretty interesting because of the way it um, portrays the return from the return and what the purposes that Cyrus may have had in mind for in sending the people back to establish the temple. Yeah. Um, so um, any closing thoughts on uh, these chapters or the book in general? I don't. 
we've sure. been going for a while, so I, I, I kind of want to wrap things up. I'm um, loving the book. It's just I'm loving the book. It's just uh, we. I guess we covered too much reading for me, but <laughs> I'm a little slow. Oh, uh, don't worry about it. I mean, you can go, you can go at your own pace with the reading for sure. Um, I always try and just do like a little bit every night, and even if it's like ten pages, just just a little bit. By the end of the week, you'll have it all done usually. Um, but yeah, I know people have really busy schedules, and it can be a lot. So um, I was hoping we'd read the whole next part. Yeah, for yeah. In time, the rest of the book for next thing out. Yeah. Anyway, so if anyone doesn't have any last thoughts on it, um, last call. Okay, we're gonna close it out. Um, thanks again, everybody, for coming. And after we go off live, stick around. We'll do some housekeeping matters, and uh, hopefully, we'll see everybody here next week. <laughs>